Episode 1, Prologue I am not a thief! Within the welfare center's dormitory, a nine-year-old girl faced everyone's suspicions, her eyes red. She had a pair of large, watery eyes and was radiantly beautiful. However, her body looked frail due to malnutrition. Seeing everyone look at her with disdain and hate, she felt wronged and choked. That jade is... it is mine! I am not a thief! My mom left that behind for me! So what you're saying is that I stole your stuff? Standing opposite her was a girl about her age. Tilting her head, the girl eyed her coldly before she turned to smile innocently at the other children. Compared to her, the girl looked sweet and proud, as though she were a lofty little princess showered with everyone's love. As soon as she spoke, the children around them immediately came to her defense. You're lying! You're lying! Why would Melicia steal your stuff? Right, right! That's impossible! How is Melicia a thief? Clearly it's you who stole her thing! Faced with all their condemnations and questions, the girl was unable to give any convincing explanations to defend herself. Absolutely aggrieved, she rubbed her eyes bitterly and burst into tears. <laughs> this really is my jade! Give it back! Melicia eyed her gloatingly and turned to speak to everyone. Everyone, it's clear. Elena is the thief. Don't play with her anymore. Thieves are bad. Several children vigorously nodded their heads. Uh-huh. Let's listen to Princess Melicia. Ignore her in the future. She's a thief. She's a thief! Elena is a bad girl! Stealing Malicia's things! Shame on you! The children roared with laughter as they dispersed. Alone, the girl leaned against a wall. She held back her tears as she gazed at the other children's backs, tightly clenching her fists. A row of men clad in black suits lined up outside the director's office. An energetic-looking elderly man, past 50, sat sternly on a sofa. The set of traditional American garments on him enhanced his respectable demeanor, and under the shadows of his brows was an air of fury. He might be getting on in years, his appearance slightly aged, but from his handsome facial features, one could still picture how stunning he looked during his prime. The director brought in a pile of documents, carefully showed them to the elderly man, and respectfully offered them to him. Mr. Lewis, these are the children who came into the welfare center last year. All their information is there. Please have a look. The elderly man reached out his hand for the documents, went over some of them, and then furrowed his eyebrows. The assistant by his side caught sight of his expression and raised his head to smile at the director, asking, That child is about eight to nine years old. May I ask, of those who were admitted last year, how many fit this condition? The director briefly went over his memories and swiftly replied, Please hold a moment. The elderly man continued to scan through the documents, yet his eyes were fixed on a family portrait. He suddenly stretched out his hand and pointed, Let me see this girl. The director felt stunned before hurriedly nodding. I understand. I shall arrange for her to meet you fast. He made a call, and soon after, a teacher brought a girl in. Melicia diligently stood in front of the elderly man, with her hands to her back and chest puffed up. Grinning from ear to ear, she said, Grandpa, nice to meet you. I'm Melicia. The elderly man expressionlessly stared at her and carefully examined every inch of her face. His eyes slowly narrowed as he looked at her darkly and gloomily. Melicia curiously wrinkled her brows. This elderly man's fierce-looking face and stern demeanor somewhat frightened her. Just as she retreated a few steps, she saw him suddenly gesture to her. Come, let Grandpa take a look at you. Okay. Melicia hesitantly took two steps forward. The elderly man gently held her shoulders and observed her up close. Despite the compatibility in age, he still felt that neither her appearance nor her facial features were similar to that person. His vision slowly shifted downwards until it landed on the jade near her collarbone. The elderly man held up the piece of jade and softly asked, This jade? Malisha stiffened for a moment before smiling sweetly. This jade was given to me by my mother. The elderly man slightly narrowed his eyes. His assistant quickly realized the situation. 
he hurriedly took out another piece of jade from a briefcase and passed it over to him. The two pieces of jade were put together, and they fit perfectly. The elderly man's hand slightly shuddered. Upon witnessing this, the assistant understood his intentions and walked over to the director. He muttered a few words to him before taking out a check with a large amount from the briefcase and handing it over to him. The director accepted it with a smile. A row of luxurious black limousines was parked at the entrance of the welfare center. A desolate-looking girl climbed up the back iron railings in the distance and with dull eyes watched Malisha follow a group of men in suits and enter an extended Bentley. The moment the doors of the vehicle closed, Malisha coldly swept her gaze over to her direction. Coincidentally, their sight collided. Malisha smiled slyly at her before the car windows rolled up and the vehicles drove off into the distance. Thus, the lives of two children took an unexpected turn. On one end of the hospital hallway, the accompanying secretary held her phone in one hand and a report in another, presenting from the document. Monica Thames, 18 years old, a student. Your father was negligent in his business and went bankrupt. According to investigations, all information is correct. Your overall physical condition is proven fit by the medical tests, and there won't be any issue regarding your custody rights. This girl was regrettably unable to meet the conditions for in vitro fertilization. Then, they could only seek an alternative method. Monica Thames sat still on the bench. She gazed at the scenery outside the window. Her expression was strangely calm, yet deep within her watery eyes was complete darkness. Although the young lady's delicate features made her seem even younger, her tender face, as if she had experienced many vicissitudes of life, showed a look that was incompatible with her age. She was the chosen one, the one in a million. Because of her aesthetically pleasing visuals, the remuneration provided by her employer was generous. The sum of $5 million was already astronomical to her. Three days ago, she secretly signed a contract without her father's knowledge, and then she was brought over to this location. She was locked inside this room every day and was forbidden from contacting anyone outside, and even more so, from going out, as though she were a quarantined patient. She knew that to prepare for her pregnancy, they needed to ensure her health so that her body would be better suited to carry the baby. The three meals made for her a day were extremely exquisite. Ham, bacon, bread, beef, everything was almost too extravagant. She knew that those foods were beneficial to people preparing for pregnancy, so even though she did not like to eat them, she could only forcefully swallow them down. Monica Thames dared not disobey any orders, as absolute obedience was one of the conditions stated in the contract. Thus, even today, she faithfully followed her employer's secretary and anxiously came to this private institute to undergo medical examinations. This employer of hers was very mysterious. She had not seen him even once. She only knew of the contract and that signing it would entitle her to remuneration of five million dollars. This amount should be enough to help her father overcome the financial crisis. She did not dare to mention this matter to her father. When she left, she only left behind a note and did not say a word of goodbye. Because of the lengthy period of surrogacy, she would probably be unable to go back home anytime soon. Thus, she temporarily did not have to worry about facing her father's apprehension. According to one of the conditions in the contract, she needed to be put under close observation all the time until she conceived. When this condition was met, before the next day, $1 million would be deposited in advance to her father's bank account. She would be paid an extra sum if she bore a baby boy, as mentioned by the secretary. Surrogacy. Ha! Huh. It was laughable. She had thought of everything to earn money, but selling her body had never been one of them. However, since it was a large sum, she could not help but be moved by it. In financial straits, she chose this road. By the sea, there was a luxurious C-suite villa. The villas around this area were presented with the best views, and thus, the exorbitant land prices were given. After a simple tidying up, an extravagant limousine brought her to the villa. 
the vehicle quickly departed after she was given some instructions. The secretary told her that, tonight, he would arrive. Monica Thames took a deep breath. She was no longer in the mood to appreciate the beautiful sea view. She tugged at her luggage and entered the villa with a heavy heart. Night fell. In a luxurious bedroom, the curtains were tightly drawn and blocked all the lights. Within the silent room, she took a bath and quietly lay down in the king-sized bed. She was requested to wear a blindfold. She lost her sense of sight, yet her sense of hearing was greatly enhanced. She could even hear the sea breeze blowing and the waves crashing onto the shore. Without the blaring lights and the hustle and bustle of the city, the silence could make one's hair stand on end. Episode 2, The Obscure Night The silence could make one's hair stand on end without the blaring lights and hustle and bustle of the city. Soon after, she heard the sound of an engine running in the distance, becoming louder as it got closer. A vehicle came to a halt in front of the villa, and its engine was turned off. Her normally calm heart tightened as she felt an unprecedented anxiousness and restlessness at that moment. She couldn't keep herself cool as the footsteps walking up the stairs became louder as they got closer. She was feeling uneasy. The door flung open. Along with the sound of steady footsteps, Monica could sense that someone had come in and stopped by her bedside. She was absolutely nervous by now and promptly sat up on the bed. He's here. Is it my employer? She was on tenor hooks when one side of the bed slightly dipped, a clear indication that someone had sat on it. Monica, who was feeling perturbed, leaned her back against the wall for support. She felt awkward and was glad that in front of her was stifling darkness. She could only barely make out a towering figure before her, yet her heart still beat with helplessness. Although she could not see his face, somehow she was able to sense his strong, overwhelming presence, especially his cold line of sight. He had the air of aggressiveness, unique to a ruler, as if he were a noble, arrogant overlord. As for her, She was just like a tribute brought to him in ancient times. Monica opened her mouth and spoke in a somewhat vague manner. You, who are you? The man remained mum. He moved his body and slightly bent forward, leaning closer toward her. Monica could only feel his looming presence getting nearer. Immediately, the imposing figure pressed down on her and completely imprisoned her under his body. Her body shook from the effort of withstanding his body weight. She curled into a ball, and then she was no longer able to move. She nervously held her hands before her chest. She was nearly suffocating. Not waiting for her to react, the man narrowed his eyes and pulled her clothes straight up. Her soft, milky white skin was exposed to the air. Suddenly, his large hands delved in. Wait! She exclaimed with a trembling voice. May I take a look at you? Why? His youthful, yet deep voice was akin to red wine rich and mellow. It was a husky voice that could draw people in. I can't see anything. I'm scared. He scoffed, and with an extremely deep voice, said, You don't have to look, and you don't have to be scared. The girl's delicate body had yet to develop fully. She was still so pure, and her slender waist could easily be held in his one hand. His icy fingers rubbed her lips harshly and played around with them nonstop. Just close your eyes. How delightful the tender touch was, just like silk. His fingertips were a little moist and chilly, and when they came into contact with her warm skin, she could not help but shrink a little. The darkness in front of her eyes made her more afraid. His thin lips left her body. He apparently thought that her one piece was in the way, since he tore it apart in the next second. His near-violent moves made Monica stiffen. She dared not to move recklessly. Her heart beat thunderously in her chest. It was as if her heartbeats were trying to escape from her throat. Shame, panic, fear. With all these emotions weighing on her, she could hardly breathe. It was at that moment that she started to regret her decision. She initially thought that she could do it. It was just bearing a child for him after all. She might have no experience, but as a woman, this was something she would come across sooner or later. However, facing this unknown yet domineering man, she lost all the courage she had at the start. Right now, she only felt utter fear. She had just become an adult and had not experienced any form of intimacy yet. 
She had never even held a boy's hand in her entire life. Naturally, her heart was unwilling. Still, she was able to resist his invasion. Under his provocation, she slowly opened up like the flower buds under the morning sun. He lowered his head and, ignoring her uneasiness and fear, brushed his thin lips past her jawline, making her tremble profusely. Her body became more sensitive to his invasion. Monica's breathing became ragged. Unconsciously, she reached out and grasped his large hands to try and stop his invasion. The man seemed to have perceived her thoughts. Grabbing her hands, he tied them up with ease and lifted them high above her head. She was even more frightened. Her heart was constantly resisting, but it was to no avail. Her entire body trembled from utter fear, yet she had no way to refuse him. Monica shrunk her shoulders in an attempt to dodge him, but little did she know that the unintentional contact made the man's body temperature rise and become scalding hot. The man sucked in a breath of cold air. He actually almost went out of control. This girl was truly very attractive. He could not believe that he nearly lost himself. Monica was shocked at the overly intimate move and tried to shrivel her shoulders further. She instinctively pushed him away. Don't! He ignored her little resistance. Monica exclaimed. Subconsciously squirming around, she incessantly pushed his chest away. However, he merely grabbed her wrists tightly. To prevent her from resisting any longer, he took off the last thing in his way. Monica was breathless when she realized what was about to happen. She tried to refuse his touch as her body continuously sank. How she wished she could hide away in a world where he could not enter. His dominance seemed to have scared her really badly. No, don't! Don't? Stephen Lewis felt dissatisfied with her resistance. He slowly raised his eyes and held her chin with his hand. Under the dim moonlight, his eyes dropped down to look at her bashful face. He asked coldly, What? You don't want this? Monica tensed up and pursed her lips. He squinted his eyes and mercilessly rubbed her lips with his thumb. Woman, you know what you have to do by coming here, right? Her expression suddenly hardened as her body continuously quivered. She was uncertain whether it was because of the pain or fear of his callousness. Staying silent for a long time, her almost hoarse voice let out broken sobs. I know. Then, do you still need me to tell you what to do? His straight eyebrows twitched as his ice-cold voice asked this. Monica bit her lower lip hard as her eyes welled up. She then felt a string of moisture flowing into the slit of her lips, and her mouth was filled with the taste of bitterness. She knew that they were just going by the contract. They were not in a relationship with each other, so any form of intimacy was established by the contract and nothing else. Still, no matter what, she was not going to bear with this humiliation. Stefan gave her a cold smirk. He was not intending to give her any more time to get used to him. Binding her hands, he shoved them to the top of her head. The corners of his mouth curled into a nearly cruel smile. Your mouth, open it. Monica's facial expression gradually went numb. She then slowly shut her eyes in despair. Her arms circled his shoulders with difficulty as she buried her face into his neck. At that moment, she knew that she had already crossed over into the depths of sin. The man was satisfied with her surrender and abruptly delved in at one fell swoop. Breaking that layer of the boundary was such a vivid sensation. Gritting her teeth, Monica endured. Her voice was hoarse. She inhaled in the cool air as she tried to withstand the excruciating pain. Her body became as stiff as a stone and was no longer able to move. It was a jet of something unfamiliar and strange, as if it was ripping her apart. In that instant, her vision almost went black and she nearly passed out from the pain, as everything was too much for her to withstand. Episode 3 the kiss and humiliation. He didn't have time to care about her pain because he was so desperate for her right now. This was just an intimate session to him. No man wants to waste time on this, especially if it involves a woman for whom he has no feelings. Being sympathetic to her? He was her employer. He even rewarded her handsomely. This pain was something she needed to deal with. That pain, along with her grievances and hardships, poured out uncontrollably with her tears. She exclaimed once in pain, her eyes turning bright red, but she bit her lower lip stubbornly and tried not to show her frail side. She was, however, 
physically unable to withstand such a fierce invasion. <gasps> she broke down like a lost kitten in the end. The man was like a cold-blooded emperor, robbing her of everything to the point of cruelty. The boundless pain she felt was just like the unrelenting ocean waves. As she was drowning, she was floating and sinking continuously. Slowly letting herself go, she gradually zoned out. She stretched out her fingers to reach for something, but there was nothing she could hold on to. Everything in front of her was black, and her mind was in a state of disarray. They fit each other perfectly. Perspiration heated their bodies. Stefan buried his fingers into her hair. He only felt greedy for more. She implored him with a clouded mind. During their excitement, he suddenly felt a puff of warm moisture on his neck. He lifted his eyes slightly, only to see her biting her lip and whimpering from the agonizing pain. Stefan's face stiffened. Gazing on the small face that was enduring it, he subconsciously lowered his head and smacked her lips with his. The tip of his tongue intruded her cavern and captured the little snake within. He twirled it around with his and drowned in all her sobs. A kiss to him was taboo. Kissing meant that they were mutually in love. He had never kissed a woman before, because in his eyes, their lips were filthy. The women lingering around him were always socialites, daughters from wealthy families, or celebrities, and he had never touched any of those butterflies. However, he did not know why, but he kissed Monica. To be accurate, she was his first. He had never known that the sensation of a kiss could be this delicious. Stefan slightly squinted his eyes and pressed onto her. From within a suffocating suppression, he quenched his raging thirst with poison. On the bed were tender and romantic sentiments. They sank into ecstasy. Within the darkness, Monica opened her eyes. The piece of red silk on her eyes was totally soaked with cold sweat. She heard the sound of shower water running from the bathroom. She nudges her body slightly, but a sharp pain emanates from her fingertips. It turned out to be from their intimate session when her fingers were clutching the ends of the bed. Her nails had broken from all of her clutchings, and they had sunk into the tips of her fingers. She pretended to be calm to console herself. Everything had finally come to an end. Hopefully, this was her only pregnancy. She had to wait until she gave birth to his child. After that, she could get the money and go back to her normal life. It was now past midnight. Stefan took a shower and changed into a set of clothes. His tall and broad figure stood in the room, and it was overwhelming. His eyes remained emotionless. Under the moonlight, the woman curled herself in the white sheets and continued to pant. On her smooth body were traces of his brutality. The pool of blood on the bed spread out just like a bloody flower in bloom. A ghastly sight. Monica lay motionless in bed, her back facing him. Her body, which was curled up, was trembling and was as stiff as a stone. He looked at her silky soft hair, unkempt and completely drenched in sweat, messily draped over the edge of a pillow. He gave her a cold glance and motionlessly stood there for a moment before turning to leave. Bang! Hearing the cold sound of the door closing, she hugged her shoulders and felt the frightening bruises on her wrists. Her eyes were swollen but she dared not to let out even the tiniest cry, even if it was just a whimper. Soon after, she heard the sound of a car engine starting up coming from outside. The vehicle drove into the distance, further and further away, until the sound of the engine subsided. Realizing his departure, she could no longer endure it. She immediately shut her eyes and sobbed her heart out. In this unfamiliar seaside villa, she gave the pure her completely to an unknown male. Before, she wondered why he would choose her. After giving it some thought, she concluded that it was because of her identity as a commoner that would be unable to fight for the child's custody rights in the future. She wasn't sure if this was right or how long she should keep it from her father. Her family's situation had pushed her into a corner, and she was at her wit's end, but she didn't regret it. In fact, she was in no position to regret it. This thing called pride was too much of a luxury for someone struggling to make ends meet, and it was also her only way out. Moreover, as an adopted child, for the past few years, her father had always treated her like she was his own flesh and blood. 
Despite her adoptive mother and sister not liking her, she was not short of anything in life. Thus, she was already very grateful for this. Now that the financial crisis had left her family in dire straits, she had to repay their kindness somehow. She did not want to think of anything else for now. Stefan would never know that this night had left so many everlasting scars in her life, and even more so, he would never know of his future interactions with this woman. Dawn, the rays of the morning sun. Monica carefully sat herself up on the bed and slowly removed the piece of red silk covering her eyes. She covered herself up with the snowy white sheets and walked to the window to pull the curtains wide apart. However, the rays of the sun were unable to shine into her heart. From outside came hurried footsteps. The door swung open. Shocked, Monica spun around, only to see a dignified and glamorous lady walk in and approach her with an angry face. Obediently walking by her side was the secretary she had signed the surrogacy contract with. The lady stepped towards her. Standing still, looking all high and mighty, she examined her from head to toe with disgust. Once she lay her eyes on the hickey on her body, she froze. Monica anxiously covered her body with the blanket more tightly, but the blanket was unable to hide that love mark on her neck. Jealousy and anger pricked her eyes. She spoke furiously. You're... you're that surrogate? Monica gulped. Yes, and you are? Smack! The reply she received was a tight slap to her face. You shameless creature! You! How dare you! The lady grabbed her hair with rage as her face drained of color. Don't think that by giving birth to his baby, you can use this to gain status. Let me warn you, I am his legitimate fiancé, and you're just a surrogate. Don't even think of coveting something that is not yours. You understand? Monica was astounded. She spoke perplexedly. I, I signed the contract, and I I I'm clear about the clauses. I, I know my place. Would you please? It's good that you understand. Her chest puffed up as she spoke, although she knew deep down that if she were fertile, this girl would never come along to give birth to the successor of the Lewis family for him. However, once she was reminded of them tangling in the sheets for an entire night, she could not help but flip out in jealousy. Episode 4, She is Pregnant You'd better get pregnant from just this. Don't even think he'll touch you again, she said bitterly and marched off. Monica crumpled to the ground, her spirit leaving her body. The secretary hurriedly helped her. Get up, the floor is chilly. Your health is important. Two months later, at the Lewis family's private hospital, the secretary got a hold of the examination report. Seven weeks pregnant. Her condition was stable. It was a pair of identical twins. She took out her phone and reported everything to Stefan's assistant. Monica came out of the examination room. The examination report was of no concern to her. She was now quite like a wooden puppet under the master's control. In any case, she did what she was supposed to do and went along with everything they had prepared. She needed not worry about anything else. The secretary came to her. Giving her a faint smile, she consoled. Miss Thames, your condition is now very stable. Don't get too jittery. <laughs> you don't have to worry about anything else. Please stay in the villa to take care of the babies for these few months. If you have any requests, please feel free to contact me. Monica looked up and muttered, I want to see my father. Two months ago, she simply left a note behind without saying goodbye. He must be worrying about her. The secretary tensed up. This? Buzz has instructed that you are forbidden from going outside. I just want to see my father once. I don't have any other requests. Can't you even do just this much? At Monica's beseeching look, the secretary eventually relented. All right. This was initially a difficult decision for her. Monica was not allowed to go outside according to the terms of her contract. However, looking at this poor girl who had become a surrogate at such a young age, she assumed she must be going through some difficulties at home. As a result, she scheduled a meeting with her father without the CEO's permission. The meeting was arranged in a cafe. Monica's father rushed to the location as soon as he received the message, arriving 30 minutes ahead of schedule. He fidgeted in his seat in the private room. He was so worried about her after she left without saying goodbye that he spent many sleepless nights tussling and tossing around in his bed. 
His wife even mocked her for being ungrateful and heartless in front of him, as if she had run away from home with some random scumbag. Their family was disintegrating. While the family was in dire straits, the father had no idea where she was. However, the next day, he mysteriously gained a million dollars more in his bank account the following day. He instinctively linked it to her disappearance. He even thought that something bad might have happened to her. Monica was not, in fact, his biological daughter. Ten years ago, he unintentionally adopted her from a welfare center. He did, in fact, have a biological daughter. The Thames family was doing well at the time, and he decided to adopt Monica because she was intelligent and sensible. He had no idea that his wife and biological daughter would be so hostile to her after he had adopted her. At first, he didn't mind. He reasoned that because of the little girl's decency, she would eventually gain the approval of her wife and daughter. However, he was wrong. Usually, he was too busy to care about the little things happening at home. However, as a father, how would he not know of his wife and daughter bullying her during his absence? Monica was indeed an intelligent child. Even if she suffered at the hands of his wife and daughter, she never complained to him even once. Thus, he truly felt guilty toward her. In fact, the Thames family was originally well off. He had a property on the market that generated stable profits, so they were considered to be living in wealth. However, at the start of the year, a financial storm suddenly swept across the globe, leaving his entire family in shambles. The company was operating under a constant loss. Many shareholders had their investments retracted. Seeing that the company was about to go bankrupt, his wife pointed her finger at Monica and blamed her for it. This was because, just the year before, he willingly spent the money originally set aside for investments to send her to a prestigious dormitory-based high school to study, to be away from this trifling home. In his wife's opinion, if it had not been for this particular move of his back then, the company would not have been affected by the economic crisis, and the Thames family would not have fallen to such a state. This matter caused many heated arguments in the household. When Monica went back home during the holidays, the mother-daughter pair used to shut the doors and beat her up while he was away. Because of this, he almost succumbed to a heart attack. He saw the door being pushed open by someone, the secretary, and Monica slowly walking in, and he was filled with dread. Her pupils shook slightly when she saw her father. She became teary-eyed, but quickly recovered. Her father stood up and looked skeptical at the secretary. She quickly took her to leave and closed the door for them, realizing the gravity of the situation. Monica! He approached her with a worried expression on his face. He rested his hands on her shoulders and examined her from head to toe. What have you been up to for the last two months? Did you realize how worried I was the entire time? Feeling ashamed, she looked up at him. Only two months had passed, yet his entire hair was already a shade of gray, and the lines on his face were more prominent. He worried about her for many days, settling the mountain of documents piled up at the company and searching for her in his free time. He split his attention to her and the company. He had been overworked. Dad, don't worry about me. I'm quite all right, Monica assured. She helped him sit down before asking, How's the company? Did you deposit that sum of money? He went straight to the point. Monica was stunned, unsure of how to answer him. She was flustered for a moment before quickly putting on a disguise. He held the back of her hand tightly. Oh, child, tell me the truth. Don't lie to me. Don't make me worry about you again, all right? He suddenly thought of something terrible. Sitting up straight, he hurriedly asked, Did you do something silly? Seeing her head lowered and not saying anything, he tried to find clues from her face, yet it was in vain. He proceeded to point toward the door with suspicion. Who was that lady just now? Monica remained silent for a long time. Eventually, with a voice as soft as an insect's buzzing, she confessed, I... I have become a surrogate. The room suddenly became dead silent. His pupils constricted, and he stared at her in disbelief. You? How could you? Dad. As her voice trailed off, she next heard a deafening whack. He had slapped her in his anger. Her face twisted to the side from the force behind the slap. In a daze, she touched her burning hot cheeks as she heard him question her with fury. Why did you have to degrade yourself like this? Being a surrogate is something that you can do. 
She was still so young, at a blooming age. But she actually went to become a surrogate. Did she know that this would ruin her life? In her eyes, as a father, was he useless to the point of being unable to protect his daughter? I will not touch one cent of this money. I, Matthew James, need not go to such an extent. When he was done talking, he angrily stood up from his seat and left the room. Monica lowered her head, dumbfounded, and tightly gripped the hem of her clothes. Episode 5, Unexpected. Six months later, Monica was accompanied by the secretary to process her papers for resuming her studies at her university. On the way there, she suddenly felt a sharp pain from her belly, which was not subsiding. On tenor hooks from the past few months, Monica unexpectedly went into premature labor. They would not reach Lewis's family's private hospital on time. So the secretary hastily drove her to a gynecology hospital in town and calmly went through the necessary procedures. Monica lay on the bed, her face pale as death. When she looked up, a fluorescent lamp's light flashed in front of her eyes. She broke out in a cold sweat while in excruciating pain. She was finally going to be released after eight months of pregnancy. The secretary accompanied her to the delivery room, encouraging her at all times. Don't be afraid, Miss Thames. You and the kids will be fine. I'll be outside waiting for the good news. Thank you. Monica closed her eyes as she was pushed into the delivery room, the doors shutting behind them. The director of the hospital was acquainted with Matthew. Upon learning that the one who was about to give birth was Monica, the doctor immediately contacted him. Matthew rushed to the hospital after receiving the message and waited impatiently outside the delivery room. Four hours later, a resonant wail could be heard from the room. It's a healthy baby boy! The nurse placed the baby into an incubator and sent him to the nursery room for newborns. Matthew did not care about the baby. He paced about and frantically looked around outside the delivery room. The secretary walked toward the nursery room. Inspecting the newborn from the other side of the glass window, she turned to ask, What about the other one? The nurse apologetically replied, We're terribly sorry. Because it is a premature delivery, the younger one is too weak. When he came out, he was already not breathing. The secretary's face stiffened from shock and inquired, Is there no hope? The nurse frankly said, No. She was disappointed, but she could do nothing about it. Fine. Please deal with that child accordingly. When she was done talking to the nurse, she held up her phone to send an ambulance Oh, She intended to transfer the newborn to the Lewis family's private hospital. Before she left, she filled out a check and passed it over to Mr. Thames. She spoke politely. Mr. Thames, your daughter has suffered a lot for these past few months. This is the remaining payment. Please accept it. Dazed, Mr. Thames received the check from her. The secretary then left in a hurry. Inside the delivery room, Monica was exhausted of her energy and she passed out. The nurse went over to her and was about to deal with the stillborn infant. However, just as she held him up, she noticed something strange. Her pupils shook and her expression changed drastically. She frantically rushed toward the doctor with the baby. Doctor! Six years later, time passed. Years and months went by in a flash. Within the bustling crowd in a departmental store, Monica, who was pushing a cart, anxiously looked around back and forth. Her steps were hasty. She just went to the daily essentials section to take something. However, when she looked backward, he was gone and was nowhere to be found. Passing by the toys section, she slowed down her pace and scanned the entire area. Suddenly, she caught sight of a petite figure. Monica shrugged before sighing helplessly. The corners of her mouth curled up and she chuckled to herself. She then pushed the cart toward that direction and bent down behind the figure. A little boy was standing in front of a rack, his eyes focusing on a beautifully wrapped remote-controlled racing car. He seemed really young, about five or six years of age. He was wearing a set of clean school uniform that was a little big for his thin frame. Smooth, silky jet black hair, jade-like skin, a youthful face with exquisite features and rosy cheeks, he was quite a lovely boy. He owned a pair of large, glistening eyes, which twinkled at times, clear and beautiful. His deep-set eyes were framed by thick, curly lashes 
that were slightly upturned like two feathers of a black phoenix. His black orbs were clear and free of any impurities. This charming young boy looked just like a fairy tale. However, right now, the little fairy had a serious look on his face, seemingly possessing the maturity of an adult. One hundred and fifty dollars? Too expensive! The young man's voice had a solemn tone that was out of character for his age. The way he furrowed his brows as he began counting with his fingers reminded him of a matured man. He then sighed in agony, his shoulders dropping, as if he was in a world of darkness. Monica helplessly chuckled at his dejected demeanor, yet her heart was slightly bitter. She pursed her lips and reached out her hand to tap his shoulder. The little boy, shocked, twisted around. Realizing that it was her, his face turned a strange shade of red. Mommy! Mommy looked for you for so long! Didn't Mommy ask you to follow her obediently and not to run around? Monica pretended to be mad, and the little boy clearly felt some guilt. His small hand carefully latched onto her neck. With his lashes slightly drooping, he incessantly blinked his wide eyes as he mumbled, Mommy, don't be angry. Andres will not run around anymore. <laughs> My dear Andy. She kneeled down and hugged him. What are you looking at? Andy instinctively pointed at the racing car, but as though he had thought of something, he quickly retraced his little fingers. He then lifted his face and feigned disinterest. Mommy, Andy is just looking and doesn't really want it. He might have said this, but his eyes never left that beautifully packed remote-controlled racing car. They have completely given him away. Her expression went cold. He was still very young, yet he had learned to speak against his wishes. She knew that he really wanted it, but he was trying to help her save up. This child was an absolute sweetheart from birth. She laughed and patted his little head. She stood up and went to the counter, indicating the racing car to the cashier. Andy locked his sight on the toy before looking at Monica again. As though having guessed what was about to happen, his eyes lit up and radiated with excitement. He ran toward the counter and longingly stared at the beautifully packed toy that was now in the hands of the cashier, not looking away even once. The cashier placed the racing car on the counter to scan its barcode. The little boy placed his hand on the counter and eagerly hovered over the edge of it on his tiptoe, his small face showing a contented expression. Monica followed behind him. Looking at his bright smile, she was visibly moved. If she could not even grant the small wish of her child, then she did not deserve to be called a good mother. All these years, she had owed too much to this child. She gave birth to twins for that man six years ago. They were both quite weak when they were born because they were premature babies. Andy's situation was even more dire. Andy's brother had taken up too much of the nutrition while they were still in her womb, and as a result, Andy was not breathing when he was born. Her father had told her that as soon as the older one was out. He was taken to the newborn nursery ward and then transferred to another hospital. Simultaneously, the nurse who had delivered the babies made an unexpected discovery. Andy, who was declared dead when he was born, was slightly breathing. Episode 6, Separated Brothers After a series of emergency medical treatments, the newborn was finally rescued from the brink of death. However, his physical constitution was just too weak, and he was always down with illness. Her poor child was also fatherless from birth, to make up for this, she doted on him with all her might. She gave him all the love she had in her heart. This was to make him understand that, even without a father, the amount of love he received could only be greater. Hence, she gave him the name Andres Thames. While she thanked the heavens for blessing her with him, she also wished that he could grow up healthy. As for Matthew James, her father helped her conceal the truth from him. Her father had a pretty good relationship with the director of that hospital, and the man went against his professional ethics, helping them falsify the hospital records. Thus, Stefan remained unaware that the second baby had survived, and Andres was able to stay with her mother. If the man were to know of Andres' existence, he would definitely take him away from her. She could not imagine how desperate she would be at that. She returned to university after giving birth to continue her studies, her father's company eventually failed, and he later filed for bankruptcy with the court. Stefan kept his promise. After she gave birth to a son for him, 
he paid her more than the agreed upon sum. He was incredibly generous. This also alleviated many of her burdens, and the large sum of money helped to pay for her father's debts. After the company he worked from scratch, unless he was already getting having gone through the lowest point of his life, he was tied to things around him. He had long lost the fight of him. He was unwilling to work too hard again and ridden with her adoptive mother, Rosie Thames, stripped of the splendor, regretted marrying the useless old prick, Matthew. She was originally a housewife, but due to life's constraints, she had to go out and do odd jobs. However, due to her previous life of comfort, she developed a habit of nitpicking and was thus often fired from her jobs. Reprimanded by others at work, Rosie vented her anger at Monica and her son. Emma Thames, her adoptive younger sister, had a less than stellar academic achievement. Her high school results did not qualify her for university, so she had to settle on enrolling in a vocational school. However, her bossy attitude often led her to some troubles. Almost on a regular basis, a handful of shady thugs would come knocking at their door. After graduation, she loafed around even more. She had great ambition, but no real ability to back it up. Unable to secure any jobs, she idled at home and hung out with those worthless thugs from day to day. At present, the entire household was dependent on her father's measly income, yet Emma often misbehaved, frequenting nightclubs, and ended up in lots of trouble. When Andres was born, Monica had to breastfeed him, and this coincided with her studies. It was the toughest period of her life. She could not even sit through confinement properly. As she was accepted in a prestigious university, her workload was heavy. Whenever she was free, she had to catch up with overdue work. On a normal day, she had her part-time job while she took care of Andres. Her body was on the verge of collapsing. Her financial situation worsened and she failed to pay for her son's education and Andres had to drop out of kindergarten. This hurt Monica making her even more determined to finish her degree and support her son. After graduating from university, she managed to land herself a high-paying job. Hence, the family's financial situation was improved. With her adoptive mother and sister staying at home while she was out working, she was afraid of Andres being treated in the same way as her by them. Back then, when she first brought Andres home, Emma apathetically sneered at him. She was unable to forget her calling Andres in slang words. Therefore, she left the house with Andres and rented an apartment for both of them. When she had to work, Andres would be sent to a kindergarten and wait for her at the entrance once he was dismissed. Even though Andres was a bright student and Monica never had to worry about him excelling, she still regretted the year he had lost. Andres had to stay back while his peers graduated to the next class. She wondered if her child was anything like the children she'd met, he would have been wrecked. She was glad that Andres was a sensible child. Despite his tender age, he was very thoughtful and was rarely willful. Exiting the departmental store, the two were exposed to the blazing sun outside. The little guy held a toy in his hand as he trailed after her, his steps gradually becoming heavier. It was now the middle of the summer. They came out from a refreshing environment just moments ago so he was unable to quickly adjust to the sweltering heat. Andres raised a small face and cried out softly, Mommy! Monica spun around. She noticed that his entire face was bright red, his eyes and brows drooping wearily. She squeezed her brows in worry. What is it, Andres? Are you unwell? Andres' eyebrows creased. He extended his hands towards her and said coyly, Mommy, it's hot, it's hot. Andres can't walk anymore. Piggyback! Piggyback! Monica was stunned by his words and could not help but smile as she bent down. When Andre saw this, his eyes curved happily. He stuck out his tongue playfully and leaped onto her shoulders. Monica held him firmly and stood up. Satisfied, Andres clung to her shoulders, his small face pressing towards her. With an affectionate tone, he asked, Mommy, are you tired? Of course. Wait until Andres grows up and then Andres will be the one to carry Mommy. Monica grinned. Okay, Andres is really Mommy's considerate little sweetheart. 
the little boy elevated his palm-sized face and asked with a blank look, Mommy, what's a little sweetheart? It's a very heartwarming person that makes people feel warm. Oh, then Andres will only be warm to Mommy and no one else. Andres sweetly rounded his pink lips, cupped her face, gave her a smack on her lips. The mother and son laughingly bumped each other's heads and Mary Lee left the area. An extended Lincoln parked silently by the roadside. The Lincoln had a pitch black, streamlined body. From its window, a youthful yet cold, good looking face could be seen. The boy lazily lay on the genuine leather seat, a hand under his cheek. He looked to be about six, but his face had a mature and distant look that was incompatible with his age. He expressionlessly watched the joyous scene of Monica and Andres through the window. Looking from under his thin bangs, something stirred inside him, and his vision came into focus. The pair walked further and further away. Inexplicably, a strange emotion emerged from the bottom of his heart as he glanced at the backs of the mother and son. It was something that could not be explained. His heart slightly ached. It was bitter and a little sour. Soon after, he felt a sense of loneliness. Episode 7, Fiancé Only in Name He slightly squinted his eyes, and when he could no longer see the mother-son pair, instantly hung them down to conceal the loneliness that briefly appeared in them. Returning his focus to the laptop on his lap, he looked at his half-finished homework. He felt somewhat vexed and decided to turn the laptop off. A middle-aged man in a suit carefully opened the rear door of the extended Lincoln and showed the dessert he had purchased for the boy. Young master, your dessert. The butler carefully unwrapped its packaging and passed the cake to him along with a fork. The boy received them indifferently. Staring at the delectable dessert, the scene of the boy's smiling face as he hugged his toy still appeared in his mind. Suddenly, he had no appetite. Not eating! He pushed the dessert aside and coldly ordered, Let's go! The butler, Max Jeeves, stared at him blankly. He proceeded to clean up and throw the uneaten cake into a trash can by the road and boarded the vehicle. The vehicle rode off into the distance. Night fell. The Lewis Group, the office of the Chief Executive Officer, CEO. Entering one site were luxurious fixtures, stylish and elegant, extravagant to the core. A man stood still by the window, his vigorous figure tall and slender. With a towering height of 1.89 meters, his presence was overbearing. He expressionlessly looked into the distance at the city's bustling nightscape with slightly furrowed brows and distant eyes. Gracia Lewis slowly pushed the door ajar and saw the figure silently standing by the French window. The corners of her mouth formed a gentle arch. This man held the highest power in the Lewis group. He was the son of the chairman of a conglomerate the chief executive officer of an empire, the Lewis family's Stefan Lewis and Gracia's fiancé. They might not have held a wedding ceremony yet, but she was already the Lewis family's young mistress in the name. Their future wedding would definitely be grand and magnificent, the greatest sensation of the century. This man was also a sensation within the upper class of society. Many young ladies from well-known families were attracted to him, when she recalled today's headlines about the dating rumors between Stefan and Adiva, Gracia was madly jealous. In the eyes of an outsider, she was the future young mistress of the Lewis group. Who would know that Stefan and she were only husband and wife in name, but not in actuality? This man was extremely cold to her. This put her in an extremely awkward situation. Gracia placed her handbag lightly on the sofa and gingerly walked to his behind. She reached out her arms to gently cuddle his fit body and leaned her face on his broad, strong back. Stefan. His eyes regained focus. He tilted his face while maintaining his composure. Under the cool lights, his facial contour was prominent and his clean-cut features were a masterpiece. He had handsome brows and an attractive jaw. The best part of his face was his alluring, deep-set, almond-shaped eyes with pupils as dark as obsidian which could shake the heart and soul of many. Stefan was a handsome and mature man. His handsomeness was not just something on the surface. 
Although his cold face looked young, he gave off the innate aura of an emperor, haughty and domineering, naturally perfect. He appeared imposing with every move he made, just like emperors and overlords high above the masses in ancient times. With a wave of high hand, he could dictate everything. Just by his presence, one would know that he was a man who had braved many storms, a man with a cold nature. Grandpa, let me come to ask you, are you going back to the Lewis residence tomorrow night? His eyebrows slightly twitched, and a nonchalant voice came out of his lips. No. He noticed his lukewarm expression and stole a glance at the paperwork piled up on his desk. She asked with a tiny voice, Stefan, did I disturb you? Even though she was set to be his wife, the would-be legitimate young mistress of the Lewis family, she still had to mind her every move. Despite growing up with him, she felt that she had never truly entered his heart. Their engagement led her to think once more that she was the luckiest woman in the entire world. She deeply loved this man, but ironically, she never understood him entirely. Despite the fact that he was her future husband, he was rarely concerned about her. Even on their first meeting, he was like this. He was actually like this to everyone. He was arrogant, conceited, and callous. She had never seen him be affectionate to anyone except Sam. He would only conceal his domineering aura in front of Sam. Stefan's thin lips are a little crooked. When he replied, no. His ice-cold voice was tinged with tenderness. Gracia smiled a little and rejoiced inside for his slight concern, her eyes overflowing with immense love. She moved slowly around to his front and hung on to his shoulders intimately, arms stretched out seductively. Her voluptuous body drew in alluringly close to his chest. With half-closed eyes, she moved closer to his attractive face and kissed his thin, attractive lips. Stefan's slanted eyes stared vacantly at her. Jolting his face aside, her kiss landed on his jaw instead. Dumbfounded, Gracia raised her brows and looked up, only to see him glancing indifferently somewhere else. The corners of her lips bitterly furled. She laughed at herself silently. Yes, how could she forget? Although they were going to be husband and wife, his lips were always a forbidden area. No one was allowed to touch them. The two of them were just acting according to circumstances and were merely together for formality. They had no exceptions for other women. Gracia was very angry. She cupped his face with both her hands and tears formed in her eyes from resentment. Stefan, do you love me? Answer me honestly. Do you really love me? Or are you just following your grandfather's wishes? Are you just treating our marriage as an order? Despite her holding it in all the time, the news of him dating another woman in a magazine today still made her angry and sad. She couldn't bear seeing him, a godlike man in her heart, be taken over by another. Stefan's calm demeanor remained unchanged. It was still as cold as snow. He didn't understand why his thoughts were on the $100 billion development project rather than on Gracia, who stood in front of him. Gracia was indignant and attempted to kiss him a second time. He effortlessly turned his face and dodged her, shunning her far away. Gracia, stop fooling around. Gracia let out a bitter laugh, her heart somewhat dreary. She already knew that he would dodge her, yet it still hurt. He had never kissed her once, or any other woman for that matter. The capital's young master, Louis, had a heart of stone. Many women around him were attracted to him, yet none of them was special. Even her legitimate fiancé, the woman closest to him, was never given an exception. Did he really love her, or was he treating her as a comfort to his loneliness? Perhaps it was not even that. Was he even willing to act with her? She did not suspect this only once. If Grandpa had not decided their engagement, if this marriage was not established on his wishes, this man would probably not have looked at her more than once. Episode 8, This Child Was Not Hers She did not suspect this only once. If Grandpa had not decided their engagement and this marriage was not established on Grandpa's wishes, this man would probably not have looked at her more than once. If he loved her, then why would he not allow her to kiss him? and not even say an I love you to her. However, she loved him, with an almost servile manner. So she endured, gave in, and accepted all of him. He was noble, proud, and arrogant. 
He was the crown prince of the Lewis group. Despite her being deeply doted on by Grandpa Lewis, this man was simply out of her reach. Thus, she comforted herself, for who knew how many times. She told herself that if she was the Lewis family's fiancé, she was, in the future, going to be the young mistress of the Lewis family. In a few months, their engagement ceremony will be held, so she should not make a fuss. She should be satisfied with that. Unfortunately, she was greedy. She did not only want him in that way, she wanted his heart even more. Gracia smiled a little bitterly, speaking with a low voice. You really, really want to be with me, right? Stefan's heart was elsewhere, and the woman's confused expression merely fleeted across his eyes. Noticing that he was lost in thought, Gracia could not help but grab onto his collar even tighter. Stefan, do you really love me? Answer me! Stefan pushed from the persistent Gracia and returned to the front of his desk, speaking in a lukewarm voice. Gracia, don't be willful. He lowered his eyes coldly. His voice was emotionless and deep, as if he were pacifying a child throwing a tantrum. When did she ever throw a tantrum, though? Gracia was a child Grandpa Lewis had adopted into the Lewis family ten years ago. He brought her to Stefan and got them engaged. The Lewis family was a rich and powerful family of great importance, and Gracia was all the more so the apple of Grandpa Lewis's eye. She was noble and reserved. She loved Stefan, but he did not love her back. This marriage to him, a person born into a wealthy family, was unnecessary. He was just obeying his grandpa's wishes. Based on his personality, women were things that he could do without. They were not a necessity. Marriage was just something to keep his grandfather happy. It was a form of contract in disguise. His engagement with Gracia was no exception. It was just a bargaining chip. The collateral branches of the Lewis family were slowly making their moves. Many of them were eyeing his position. He was simply using this marriage as a springboard to expand the Lewis Empire's territory. Love? This word was too much of a luxury to him. What was love? Was it those socialites of the upper class fawning over him, chasing after fame and wealth? Was it the willful and arrogant Gracia? Was it the inexperienced models and artists wanting to be famous? In this world of material desires, money, and desires intertwined, who would still speak of love? Other than his mother, he had never loved any other woman. Kinship and love were all out of his reach. He was apathetic, he was cold, and he kept his world shut away. In the business industry, he could cause a commotion with a wave of his hand. His way of doing things was cold-hearted and firm. In private, one could negotiate deals with him, but they could never think of entering his heart. Talking about love? What a joke. The phone of his table suddenly rang. Gracia answered the call for him and heard a voice message from the secretary's desk. Director, the young master has arrived. A series of footsteps was heard from beyond the door. Soon after, the door to the office was pushed open and a little head emerged. Daddy! The little guy saw that Stefan was not busy, so he walked in. Realizing Gracia's presence, a tinge of uneasiness spread in his face instantly. He called out to her flatly, Mommy! Seeing this, Gracia felt somewhat uncomfortable. She did not know why she was not close to this little boy, despite being his mother. Perhaps it was because he was not her flesh and blood. Without this blood connection, the relationship was of course not as close-knitted as real mothers and sons. The little guy was very sensitive. Besides Stefan, he was quite distant from everyone else. He was like his father most of the time. They were truly cast from the same mold. His small face was always emotionless. He was taciturn and serious, just like an adult. It was as if he were not a child of his age. He was extremely mature. When he was three or four, Stefan often accompanied him. He was just like a little devil, mischievous and always loved to prank. He often teased the maids in the Lewis residence. Totally a hedonistic little ancestor. However, for the past two years, work at the Lewis Group became more arduous, and Stefan was very busy and always away. Without his father to accompany him, the little guy gradually became lonelier and quieter day by day. Eventually, he seldom talked anymore. Sometimes, looking at his small face, Gracia could not help but be reminded of the young Stefan. He was also this cold and distant to everyone. 
only in front of Stefan would he more or less display a nature unique to children. He was still a child in any case. Therefore, he would sometimes act spoiled and do some bad things to get his father's attention. Stefan, of course, doted on him and spoiled him rotten. Thus, in front of him, little Sam appeared bold. Gracia came to her senses. She smiled and waved at him. Sam, come here. Little Sam looked at her. He took a few steps towards her, but eventually stopped. He appeared to be very unwilling as he looked towards his father. Stefan spun around, and as he saw the little boy, the coldness on his face somewhat receded. He sat on the sofa, his large hands patting his long legs lightly. When little Sam saw that, his eyes curved up and he ran towards his side. A corner of Stefan's lips ascended, and he held the child up to sit on his lap. Little Sam's facial features mostly resembled Stefan, but under the shadow of his brows, he was dignified and gentle, nothing like his coldness. More like that timid girl from six years ago. His eyes were slightly strained. For many nights, that beautiful and out-of-this-world appearance would somehow appear in his mind. Underneath his body, her face was sometimes shy, sometimes flustered, and sometimes sunken. That girl was the most beautiful person he had laid eyes on. He had yet to savor her a little more, and that girl suddenly vanished from his world. Six years ago, because of premature labor, when little Sam was born, his body was very weak. Knowing that the other child was not saved, he lamented to some extent. He already thought that his heart was already as hard as ice. Because his grandpa loved children, he decided to fulfill his long-cherished wish and searched for a young woman for surrogacy. Never did he expect to save only one of his children, though. He always felt regretful and guilty about this, so he doted on little Sam more than anything else. Little Sam grew up healthy under his care. However, he was not close to Gracia. The child was innocent, but he was spirited. Normally at the Lewis residence, Gracia would also dote on little Sam, even treating him as if he were her own. However, when she was alone with Sam, her gaze on him was only filled with jealousy and malice. She hated herself for being infertile. As this child was not her flesh and blood, how much could she actually care for him? As a result, little Sam was distant toward her from a young age. Daddy, I want to play with a remote-controlled racing car. Remote-controlled racing car? Stefan nodded his brows. Haven't you gotten sick of it? Why do you want to play with one again? I just want to play with it, little Sam pouted. A rare tenderness appeared in Stefan's eyes. Okay, Daddy will buy it for you. Episode 9, The Sensible Andres A rare tenderness appeared in Louis's eyes. Okay, Daddy will buy it for you. Daddy, not only do you have to buy me one, you have to play it with me too. Little Sam plopped into his arms and greedily savored the moment of warmth between them. Gracia, who was silently standing at the side, was somewhat in a daze. For some unknown reason, she had an illusion that, no matter what, she would be unable to enter the world of this father and son pair. On Friday night, Monica brought Andres back to the Thames household. At first, Matthew was against her and Andres moving out, but understanding her circumstances and knowing her difficulties, he settled for having her visit the house once a week to accompany him for dinner. Despite Monica feeling a little fearful, there was no other way to go around this. After all, she owed him a lot. If Matthew had not taken her away from the welfare center, her fate would have probably been a lot worse. Monica carried the groceries she bought and walked behind her son. Andres bounced up the stairs and saw that Matthew had long been waiting for them in the corridor. After the company's closure, they sold the villa that they had previously stayed at and moved into a condominium far off from the city center. It was on the eighth floor, and there was no elevator. Seeing his grandpa, Andres happily ran over to him and threw himself into his embrace. When Matthew saw his adorable little grandson, his heart was immediately filled with delight. Even after a tiring day, despite his frail body, he still managed to hold him up high and hugged him into his folded arms. Grandpa! Andres beamed, his vivid eyes blinking playfully. He grabbed onto his neck and called out to him sweetly. Andres is so well behaved. Her father went closer and planted kisses on his rosy cheeks. Recently, did Andres listen to mommy properly? Yup. 
Andres is well behaved. A sweet smile was plastered on Andres' small and handsome face. Monica brought the things up the stairs. After entering, she wormed her way into the kitchen and started to prepare dinner. Rosie was still sleeping. Emma was out with her friends and would only reach home before dinner. Matthew sat on the sofa holding Andres. Andres danced with joy and excitedly said, Grandpa, Andres went to the mall with Mommy today and Mommy bought me a remote-controlled racing car. At first, Andres wanted to bring it along to play with Grandpa. The little guy was suddenly abased and dipped his head, fiddling with his little fingers. But Andre doesn't know how to play. Andres is scared it'll be spoiled, so Andre doesn't dare to open it. Listening to his words, her father's expression changed a little, and his huge hand fondled his forelock. Andres was always very sensible. He never requested anything expensive. A toy worth a hundred dollars was already a luxury item to him. Nevertheless, he stubbornly wanted it from the bottom of his heart. Matthew recalled that one time he had brought the little boy to a small garden to play, and the latter had spotted a father and son pair. The two were fiddling with a remote-controlled racing car. They were controlling it and wholeheartedly having fun on the grass. Meanwhile, Andres hid in a corner and watched the whole scene in envy. The little boy thought that if there were a day his daddy could play with him like that, it would be such a happy thing. However, for as long as he could remember, he never saw his daddy before, and his mommy never mentioned him. He could still remember when he asked his mommy where his daddy was. Once he asked that, he saw his mommy's sad expression. From then on, he dared not raise the question up again. Her father laughed and scratched Andre's straight and charming nose, teasing him. <laughs> Next time, Grandpa will help you assemble and play. Upon hearing that, Andre's eyes instantly lit up. He smiled and nodded. Here, I was wondering who came by. It turned out to be these two little wretches. These insulting words instantly destroyed the warm atmosphere of the moment. Matthew's gaze changed. His face took on a ghastly expression when he saw Rosie, who was standing at the living room's doorway in her pajamas, and with her arms folded to her chest, coldly inspecting Andres, who was in his embrace. He fumed. What are you talking about? Andres is your grandson. Andres looked at her, and his shoulders inadvertently shrank. He then remembered his mother telling him not to talk back to Rosie and Emma. He could not help but purse his lips at that. He turned to raise his small face and looked at her with a slight grin. Grandma! Rosie leered at him, spouting extremely unpleasant words. Ha! Huh, don't you call me that! You're no grandson of mine! Matthew could not refrain from raging, his heart burning in flames. What do you mean? What do I mean? Literally that. You acknowledge him, it's your business. I don't. Who would want to acknowledge this illegitimate born to a mom but no dad? Rosie shot him a cold glance. Suddenly, raising her voice, she looked in the direction of the kitchen and intentionally, or otherwise, criticized harshly. Giving birth to a son at such a young age without marrying first. Becoming a mother even before graduation. Not knowing the identity of the father of her child. Where did this illegitimate come from, then? Born to a father, but acknowledged by none? Monica's face turned pale. She pursed her lips as she heard Rosie continue with her mean words. Also, the company folded because of her. Life in the Thames family has been tough for the past few years, but someone still doesn't appreciate her good intentions and doesn't know her place. She persisted in bringing back a burden and living off of us. Isn't she shameful at all? She may be able to bear this disgrace, but not me. I don't even know where to hide my face whenever others learn of this. In the kitchen, Monica overheard the unpleasant words from the living room. Halting her hand's movements as her face turned much paler, she furiously spun around. You should know when to stop! Rosie, are you done? How can one's mouth be this vicious? Back then, if it weren't for Monica, the Thames family... Her father abruptly stopped his words and did not go on. From then until now, he had kept the origin of that huge money from Monica a secret for her sake. After all, if news of her surrogacy were to get out, it would completely ruin her reputation. Thus, what Rosie knew was that the debt was paid off with the Thames family's financial assets. What? Go on! What would happen without her? Rosie felt thoroughly humiliated and became extremely upset. Her eyes turned red as tears threatened to spill from them. 
In fact, she was so angry that she left. <laughs> All right. You're here to push aside your own family, aren't you? You even yelled at me. Matthew, what did I do all this for? I did this for the Thames family. Back then, when the company closed down, I even asked my parents for some money. I'm ashamed to go back now. <laughs> now you're yelling at me because of two outsiders. Are you going to chase me and Emma out tomorrow for them, then? Matthew was seething with rage that his face turned livid and his voice rose in volume. You! Don't make trouble out of nothing. Say what and what? Rosie screamed. When did I make trouble out of nothing? In response, Andres hurriedly stood up from the sofa and walked over to Rosie's side, his small hands cautiously grabbing onto the hem of her clothes. Grandma, don't be angry. Andres is not illegitimate. Andres has a daddy. Episode 10, Andres is a Sweetheart. Rosie lowered her head and shot Andres a cold glance. No matter which angle she looked at his youthful face, she could only feel annoyance. The flames in her heart raged even more. She squinted her eyes, raised her hand, and swung it down his face. Stop pretending to be a good boy. What are you anyway? Get out of my way. It's all because of you. Andres' face twisted to the side from the force of her slap. He slowly lowered his head and touched his cheek with his small hand. The strands of his bangs hid his eyes from view. Thus, except for his tightly pursed lips, his facial expression could not be seen. Monica heard the commotion and rushed out of the kitchen. When she saw that Andres had been hit, her anger was instantly provoked. With an aching heart, she dashed over to Andres' side and held him in her embrace. Looking up, her eyes were cold. Witnessing this, her father was unable to suppress his rage. He stood up and rushed toward Rosie. He lifted his palm at her, but was stopped mid-action by a tug at the hem of his clothes. Stunned, he lowered his head. It was only then that Andres lifted his small face. With a half-swollen face, he formed an elegant smile. Grandpa, stop fighting. Andres learned something in school today. If a family lives in harmony, all affairs will prosper. Matthew's hand halted mid-air. He hesitated for a moment before lowering it weakly. In his eyes, complicated emotions played. Rosie was obviously scared by his anger, but in the end, she saw him turn around to pour water for Andres. This child was so sensible that he gradually found having Rosie for a wife as a misfortune to the family. He had thought of divorcing her, but knew that the latter would make a scene. Moreover, it would be shameful if words got out and around the neighborhood. Monica cautiously observed the handprint on Andre's face. With fear lingering in her heart, she raised her head and stared intently at Rosie. She then got up and pulled Andre's along to the kitchen. This dinner affair was dismal, just like the ones before. After Emma came back, the mood became even more depressing. Emma had never liked Monica from the very start. This was understandable, though. Matthew and Rosie had pampered her like a little princess and showed her with lots of love ever since she was young. However, one day, another daughter barged into their harmonious family of three, and she snatched away more than half of her father's love. From then on, her father was no longer just hers. If there was anything good, he would not think of only her. If this were to happen to anyone, they would more or less be concerned as well. Monica was perfect. She got good grades was studious, and was patient with her. Because she was too good, her father loved Monica more. This was why Emma was unwilling to accept her, and why she hated her so. Back when Emma was undergoing her rebellious phase, she only felt jealousy toward and disdain for the outsider, Monica. Andres needed not to be mentioned, as she simply had no room for him. In her heart, he was just an illegitimate born to a father, but acknowledged by none. Around the dining table, it was somewhat quiet. From time to time, Andres would pick up some food for Matthew, while Monica would share interesting tidbits at work. The mood was then more relaxed. Despite Rosie and Emma not liking Andres, they dared not be impudent or openly show it with Matthew around. After dinner, Matthew received a phone call and had to head out. He reminded Monica of things and went off in a hurry. Monica did not wish to stay long in this house so she promptly cleared away the dishes 
and decided to wash them before leaving. Andres assisted his mother in washing the dishes by holding up bowls to her with his small hands. He was somewhat afraid of Rosie and Emma, so after Matthew left, he stuck with Monica in the kitchen. In the living room, Emma shifted her sight toward the mother-son pair in the kitchen with hatred. She whined to Rosie, Mom, why did you let that wretch into our family? Looking at her is so depressing. I lost my good mood. Rosie sat on the sofa, her expression not looking good as well. <laughs> Who knows? You'll have to ask your father that. <laughs> A wretch and an illegitimate. Why did our family encounter these two disasters? Emma, don't let your father hear that. Otherwise, he's going to help the outsiders and scold us. Mother and daughter, we haven't seen your father's expression today. It was really scary. When she heard about it, Emma's face drained of color. Dad actually helped them? Regarding this, Rosie was enraged. He did. Emma clenched her fists tightly and snorted coldly. He's just a bastard. His father doesn't want him, and we don't even know which guy she fooled around with to have him. Don't learn from that woman. Having a baby before marriage and at such a young age. If word of this gets out, it's really too shameful. Monica continued to wash the dishes with her head lowered, but her movement was now as rigid as a robot's. Under the dim yellow light, her expression was strangely stiff. Although they were separated by a door, the two's unpleasant words could still be heard clearly, and she found them unbearable. The ridicules from the living room continued. Monica furiously let go of the dishes, but as she was about to confront the mother-daughter pair, a tender hand suddenly held her arm gently. Startled, Monica lowered her head and saw Andres snuggling up by her side. He was looking up at her with a smile. His pair of intelligent eyes seemed to penetrate through her complex emotions. Mommy, Andres will help you wash the dishes so that we can go home fast. After saying this, he tiptoed and struggled to reach into the sink with his two little hands. Monica was in a daze for a moment. She then pursed her lips and decided to rein in her anger once more. Her anger nearly exploded so many times today, but she had to hold it in each time. They could target her, they could listen, she could endure, and she could bear. After all, she also knew that she owed the Thames family so much. If it were not for her father, she would not have had such a good life. He gave her a home. Unfortunately, this home did not welcome her. Even if she was despised again and again, she could tolerate it all. However, a human heart was ultimately made of flesh. Andres did not do anything wrong to them. He was just an innocent child. He was still so young, and he should not relive the darkness she had gone through when she was young. If Andres was not present, she certainly would flare up. Andres was by her side, however. As a mother, she wanted to leave Andres with a lovely childhood. Thus, she could only resolve not to step foot into the Thames family's house ever again. Inside a car heading back home, Monica weakly buried her face into the shoulder nook of Andres, who was sitting on her lap, and grasped his little hand a little tightly. She regretted it for a fleeting moment. She should not have been selfish to let Andres stay by her side. Perhaps, by that man's side, her son would have a father and a mother, and he would not have to bear with all this humiliation. At that man's house, Andres would live a much happier life, right? However, she hated to part with him. Six years of relationship. Blood was really thicker than water. She could no longer let go of this cute and sensible child. Mommy. Andres remained still and let her lean on his narrow shoulder. Episode 11, he had a younger brother. Monica whispered beside his ear, I'm sorry, Andres. Andres opened his tiny mouth to speak, but paused. He really wanted to know. Did his father truly dislike and despise him to the point where he threw him away and stopped caring about him? Was he really what those adults said? Born to a father, but acknowledged by none? These questions sprang to his lips, but he forcefully swallowed them back. Andres flipped his hand and held Monica's delicate fingers. He lifted his small face and gazed up at the night sky, speaking softly. Mommy, even if Andres' daddy doesn't want Andres, Andres still has mommy. Andre loves mommy the most, so don't be sad. It's all because of daddy that mommy is sad. When Andres grows up, 
Andres will definitely protect mommy. Monica raised her eyes, followed his line of sight, and gazed outside as well. She eventually gave a long sigh and hugged him even tighter. Andres is such a good child. The Lewis Residence In the living room, Sam, who was sitting on the sofa, suddenly felt a strange throbbing pain in his heart. It was unbearable. With slightly knitted brows, he gently caressed the area where his heart was located before laying his palm over it. He felt rapid heartbeats inside. His heart was in immense pain, almost suffocating. A maid who was cleaning up his toys noticed him putting his hand over his chest and contorting his face in pain. She knelt in front of him frantically. What's the matter, young master? Heart pain, Sam exclaimed, his face drenched in a cold sweat. I felt like I'd been pricked by a needle. Exactly like in the past? The maid was at a loss for words for a brief moment. These heartbeats had always been a part of the young master's life. His heart would beat quickly, and then he would be in pain. However, no cause of the pain was found each time he was admitted to the hospital. He was in good health. Even the best doctors could not tell what was wrong with him. Sam curled up on the sofa and took a deep breath of cold air, looking reserved. What's the matter? Peter Lewis slowly walked down the stairs with the support of his cane. The elderly man donned a crease-free set of traditional American garments. Despite his old age, he still looked energetic. Under the shadow of his brows, it was not difficult to realize that he was a charming and elegant man during his prime. Great Grandpa! Sam glanced up at him and called out meekly. No one could shake Peter Lewis's position in the Lewis family. He had interacted with so many powerful figures throughout his life that his every word and gesture made people tremble in fear or be in awe. Therefore, for a rich man's son like Sam, he also feared his great-grandfather. Peter Lewis, for his part, doted on this little guy with all his heart and soul. Stefan was his favorite grandson, and Sam was his flesh and blood, so it was natural that he doted on him more. Seeing his beloved great-grandson relapsing, his facial expression changed. He hurriedly inquired, Is your body not feeling well again? Is your heart in pain again? His great-grandfather showed concern for him, but Sam instinctively shied away from him. He was afraid of him. He was afraid of Mr. Peter's ever taciturn and stern face. Therefore, he never liked staying close to him. Nothing, Sam replied. Nonsense. Take a look at yourself. You're sweating profusely because you're in so much pain. Peter Lewis was in a state of devastation. I'm going upstairs to read books, great grandpa. Sam jumped off the sofa and dashed upstairs. Peter Lewis looked at his great grandson's back and slowly sighed. The night deepened. On the road, a black Bugatti Veyron raced with the wind. Neon lights were projected on the car's streamlined body and the tunnel lights transitioned from light to dark consecutively. Stefan, who was in control of the wheel, had his deep-set eyes filled with intense rage. The cold moonlight reflected a silvery glow on his perfectly carved face. He stepped on the accelerator hard with his foot. The engine revved and drowned all, all other noises. Tonight, for some reason, he was not in control of his emotions. Previously, even when he was a bad mood, he could keep his cool in the face of a difficult development project. However, he was extremely irritated right now. His phone rang. Stefan picked up the call and Sam's babbling voice came through. Daddy. Huh, what's the matter? Daddy, my heart is in pain again. Yesterday, I had a dream. I dreamed of mommy. The sports car abruptly came to a stop. Rolling down the car window, Stefan's gloomy face appeared. Huh, mommy? Gracia? Not that mommy. I dreamed of a pretty lady gently calling a name, but it's not mine. Oh, I'm not sure. Anyway, I dreamed of her and I felt at ease. It was so warm, just like... The youthful voice paused for a while before he continued grumbling. I don't like the mommy here. She's not gentle at all. Sam doesn't like her daddy. I don't want this mommy here. I want that mommy whom I saw in my dreams. The poor little guy was wailing and being willful on the other end of the phone. Stefan's face was sullen, but his voice was unexpectedly gentle. Be good, Sam. Be good, okay? Daddy is on his way home to be with you. Okay. I'll wait for you, Daddy. The call ended. 
The upturned corners of his mouth slowly went down. Do people really have telepathy? The doctor said that since little Sam was a twin, he was bound to have telepathy with his other twin. However, when the girl gave birth to two boys for him back then, one was already not breathing upon his birth. After the delivery, he sent people to that hospital to inquire about the whereabouts of the child's corpse from the staff in charge of the operation. He wanted to give the child a proper burial. However, everyone claimed that he was already taken care of. He deeply lamented the loss back then. However, for as long as little Sam could remember, he kept mentioning dreams about his younger brother to him. He claimed that his younger brother had clean and refined features and looked exactly like him. He said that it was as if he were looking at himself in the mirror completely identical. Stefan had previously thought that telepathy between twins was nonsense. However, there was once when little Sam had a high fever and the family doctor had him on an IV drip. While he was confined in bed, he kept calling out unconsciously, Mommy! Mommy! He sounded helpless and dependent, but not detached, unlike how he was with Gracia. Little Sam might have called Gracia mommy daily, but he was never close to her. When he woke up, he cried aloud. Gracia wanted to cuddle him, but he wailed and refused her touch. He kept on crying. Sam has a little brother. My little brother is sick and Sam is heartbroken. The child back then was not saved. So where did this younger brother come from? No one believed his words because he was a child. Children's words carried no harm and little weight. Little Sam eventually stopped mentioning his dreams. However, he was more distant toward Gracia thereafter. The next day was a peaceful working day. However, in the afternoon, an unexpected incident made Monica lose her job. Monica was originally planning to pass a proposal to her department head after the lunch break. Just as she stepped out, a few aimless youths dressed like hooligans boldly injured the security guards by the company entrance. They barged into her department, flung a row of tables, and shouted her name loudly. Their intrusion frightened everyone in the office. A few noticed the tattoos on their bodies and cowered to a corner. Rumors had it that these youths were well-known ruffians in a certain street in the capital and had powerful backers. Had Monica provoked these people? Episode 12, Fired from Her Job When Monica returned from her meeting with the department head, she was shocked by what she saw, but she quickly regained her composure. Once the few bossy youngsters saw her, they immediately recognized her to be Monica. They approached her and forcibly dragged her by the arm outside the office. One of them, who seemed to be the leader, ruthlessly slapped her on the face. He was evidently vexed. In a threatening manner, he asked, You're that bitch's sister? Monica was stunned. She cradled her stinging cheek and studied them. She then realized who the bitch that they were talking about was. You know how much that sister of yours owes me? He chewed on gum, his eyes looking her up and down a few times. Monica docilely pursed her lips and kept her silence. Very quickly, she sorted everything out and understood the entirety of the situation. Addressing Emma, she most likely incurred this massive debt while she was out having fun. Her family's financial situation remained precarious, so she had no money to pay off her debt. When she couldn't pay them back, she remembered Monica and gave them her company's address. Monica was filled with remorse inside. Concerned that her father would face difficulties at work, she gave them Monica's company address. Monica had no idea that uninvited guests would show up. Moreover, she was adamant about paying these thugs. Her reluctance did not stem from having a backbone, but rather from financial constraints. If she helped Emma pay off her debt, then she would not have enough money to pay Andre's school fees for the next semester. Watching her remain silent, the leader became enraged. He grabbed her by the shirt collar and tapped her face. Are you dumb? Don't you know how to speak? Will you speak up, damn it? Are you unable to pay? Several of the thugs pushed her around. Several pairs of evil-looking eyes peered into her chest. It's okay if you can't pay up. You must behave and accompany us. You don't have any money to pay? There are numerous other options. Speaking of which, you look pretty good, little girl. Do you want to join us in our game? The few of them smiled. Their eyes contained malicious intentions. 
Monica maintained her poker face. Please speak with more respect. Oh, <laughs> this girl has got an attitude. The man gave her a sinister smile and then proceeded to slap her again. Why are you so damn savage with your words? What's the reason behind owing money and not paying it back? Monica slowly turned her face back, her hand furtively feeling for her phone in her pocket. This little move, however, was noticed by a few men. The leader furiously clenched her wrist and flung her phone to the ground. The man stomped down once and the phone was smashed into pieces. She was shocked. Her eyes showed agitation. Calling the cops on us, huh? Never thought you'd be quite smart. The man spat. He then pushed her to the ground and sent a hard kick to her shoulder. Call the cops now. I'll let you call the cops. Boss, didn't that bitch say this woman has a kid? Which kindergarten is he at? One of them gave her a meaningful glance. Monica frantically lifted her face, instinctively squirting. Don't! Don't find trouble for Andres! I'll give you the money! She could remain rational as long as it did not involve Andres. Returning to her department, she hurriedly took out her ATM card with trembling hands and reddened eyes. She went to the nearest bank to withdraw a few thousand dollars and paid off Emma's debts entirely. The thugs, satisfied, counted the money while giving her a fierce stare. Eventually, they strutted away without causing further trouble. Back in the company, the manager summoned her to his office and fired her for bringing massive trouble and loss to the company. He asked her to pack her belongings and leave the company's premises as soon as possible. Earlier, she was able to remain calm despite being surrounded and confronted by those evil men. Right now, with the knowledge that she might lose her job, her eyes instantly turned red. She did not care about anything else. She pleaded with the manager not to fire her. She still had Andres. She could not lose this job. If she were to, then what about their living expenses for this period of time? The Thames family still had quite a large debt to pay off, and Andres was still young at a time where money was needed. Nowadays, the school fee for his kindergarten was incredibly high. Adding to this expense was the nutritional needs fee for his frail body, which was already exponentially high. Stacking onto this was their living expenses. She was already at her wit's end. Seeing her beg this earnestly, the manager was naturally moved. In all honesty, Monica was a very competent worker. Although she was the only female worker in the IT department, her skills were not inferior to her male colleagues. Moreover, she was hardworking, devoted, and conscientious about her job. However, the incident this time had made the higher-ups unhappy, and they came to a decision to fire her. He had no say in this, as he did not have the authority to let her stay. Therefore, although Monica pleaded, the result was still set in stone. When she got off work, she simply packed her stuff and left the company building. Several employees learned of her leaving. Many were happy, and a few were saddened. Many of them felt that it was better for Monica to scoot off. In the office, she was in the limelight on a regular basis, snatching away their chances of getting a promotion. With her great capabilities and outstanding visuals, the department had favored her. She even had the highest annual bonus amongst them. Therefore, the majority felt more relaxed when they learned of her dismissal. They had one less competition now, after all. There were a handful of colleagues that she had a pretty good relationship with. Learning of her dismissal, they sympathized and exchanged contacts with her before bidding her farewell. Monica left the company and walked on the road looking despondent. Her heart was burdened with sacks of depression. Perhaps she had gotten too absent-minded as she walked with her head down that she failed to notice the red light being up and the blasting of the horn of an approaching sports car. Only when she heard the screeching sound of car brakes sharp, loud and grating to the ears did she return to her senses. However, it was already too late. The sports car speeding along scraped past her body and came to a complete halt not far from her. Monica had yet to react when the car brushed by her side and she was knocked to the ground. The muddle-headedness disappeared when she felt immense pain radiate from her knee, which was scraped on asphalt as she fell. The documents she originally held in her chest now lay scattered on the ground. Monica lifted her eyes in shock and saw an extremely posh Porsche with a streamlined body. No matter which angle one looked at it, the car was simply magnificent. Monica once saw a description for the sports car in a magazine, 
Rumors had it that it was a worldwide limited edition, custom-made car. Only three of these existed in the entire world. When her bruised knee ached, she returned her focus to it. The friction between the car and the fabric had ripped a corner of her skirt open, and her freshly scraped knee had some dust in it as it bled profusely. Episode 13, Meeting Again. Monica's eyes suddenly filled with moisture, and she wasn't sure if it was from the pain or something else. Tears undoubtedly rolled down her cheeks and dripped steadily onto the ground. She was so upset that she burst into tears. She had led a nomadic existence since she was a child. She was all along reliant on no one. With her job gone, she really did not know what to do. Her deeply suppressed indignation finally burst out. The unforeseen events over the past few days had mentally and physically taken a heavy toll on her, and she was already at her limit of what she could endure. On top of shouldering Emma's debt, she also lost her job. At this very moment, she was without a penny to her name. What should she do now? All this while, she was very resilient to the point of unyielding. Even when she was in a difficult situation, she fended for herself. No matter how tough or how tiring it was, with Andres by her side, she thought that there was hope in life. However, reality knocked her down into a mass of bruises. Andres had once told her that when things were difficult, she should smile and everything would be all right. Even a child knew of this principle, but why could an adult like her not follow it properly? Thus, right now, she was unable to stop her tears from falling. Monica, filled with grievances and bitterness, pressed onto her cheeks. She sat on the ground casually and heartbrokenly wept. Not far away, the Porsche's engine was turned off. Its door was pushed open, and a pair of expensive leather shoes touched the ground. Stefan elegantly stepped out of the car and casually closed the door behind him. In his line of sight was a lady in a white dress, stumbled on the ground, motionless. The expression on her face could not be seen clearly with her head hanging low, but one could hear her broken-hearted sobs, making her appear rather pitiful. The lady seemed young and frail. She wore a simple office dress. Her silky smooth hair cascaded on her shoulders slightly messily and hid most of her face. Although she appeared bedraggled, it did not do injustice to her beauty. In fact, it only accentuated her stunning looks even more, making others feel sympathy for her. Stefan's eyes slowly narrowed, looking deep and far. This girl made his heart tingle. She seemed somewhat familiar, as though he had seen her before. However, with her head hanging low, he could not see her looks. His sword-like eyebrows slightly twitched. He went closer and gracefully half-squatted down in front of her. He slightly lowered his almond-shaped eyes to coldly examine the bruise on her knee. He noted that one of her pairs of slender legs was smeared with blood. The blood trickled along the delicate curves of her leg. He scanned her entire body and saw no other injuries besides that slight skin abrasion on her knee. Her injury was fortunately not severe, but she was still weeping in grief, as though she had suffered a really big grievance. He really did not know what she was crying so pitifully for. Her current appearance was a little similar to an abandoned kitten. Stefan noted that but he showed no visible reaction toward it. He was aggravated by his frustrated feelings. When he was feeling down, he would take the car for a ride in the mountains. He'd been so preoccupied with his thoughts that he'd failed to notice her on the road. Perhaps her frail frame and flimsy white dress contributed to her invisibility. She appeared delicate, and he was driving erratically on the road, so he didn't notice her until it was too late. It was a miracle that nothing bad had happened to her, Seeing her tears flow nonstop, Stefan wasted no more time. He lowered his head and fished out his wallet, removing a few large banknotes from it. He gave them to her expressionlessly. Problems that could be solved with money were not problems to him. He just wanted to settle this accident as fast as he could. Monica slightly raised her eyes. The hand holding a few banknotes had slender fingers with prominent joints, neatly trimmed nails, and a diamond ring on the ring finger. With one look, 
one could tell that this person had noble status. Looking at the money in his hand, she could not help but be stunned. She even forgot to cry. Stefan misinterpreted her silence as being discontented with the amount of money. His brows twitched, and he asked, Not enough? He had seen many greedy people before, and thought that surely the girl despised the amount he was giving her. Not waiting for her reply, he lowered his gaze again to take out a few more banknotes from his wallet. He then gave them all to her. He did not have the habit of carrying a lot of cash with him, so his wallet only contained about $2,000. However, this amount should be more than enough to patch up her wounds. Monica was dumbfounded. She was naturally baffled by his actions. However, in his eyes, her behavior was seen in a different light. The woman seemed to be greedier than he imagined. Stefan smirked, his thin lips forming into a smug curve. He simply took out all the money in his wallet. Whether she wanted more or not, he no longer wished to waste time on her. He noticed that she did not have a pocket, so he folded the money into a roll, inched closer to her, and stuffed the money in her chest. His chilly fingertips lightly brushed against her skin. Monica was stunned by the intimacy. She slightly lifted her face, and through the hair strands covering her eyes, she saw the upturned corners of his mouth. His smile had a totally different meaning behind it, and it was not formed from happiness. The man before her had a towering height of 1.9 meters and a godlike facial appearance. He had a body structure similar to those sculptures of deities, impeccable facial features, and deep-set almond eyes that seemed to radiate the dignified aura of an emperor. With just one look, one could tell that this man had braved countless storms, a man in a commanding position that could control the life and death of others. Even his smile was devoid of any warmth, as though it was only skin deep. Gazing at her, there was only pity in his eyes. Pity? Why would he look at her with pity? Suddenly, all the bottled up indignation and anger inside her overflowed and flooded out. In the next moment, she watched the man take out a pen and flamboyantly leave a string of numbers on her chest. If it's not enough, then call this number. These invasive actions provoked the anger of Monica. This action of his was an unintentional humiliation to her. Sir, what is the meaning of this? Is it because you're rich? Her eyes were aflame with rage and her voice sounded sullen. You injured someone, but you did not apologize. You think everything can be solved with money? Monica was not the type to stir up trouble for no reason. She was also aware that she was to blame for crossing the street without paying attention to her surroundings. His method of shoving money into her chest, which was similar to giving alms, enraged her. His demeanor was simply too domineering and dismissive. Thus, she glared at him coldly without another word. After all, she knew nothing about him. Monica raised her head, took out the money from her chest, pulled the man's large hand over, and smacked the money onto it. She lifted her face and directly looked at the man with her pair of moistened eyes. Stefan's chilling faint smile suddenly froze in place. His orbs constricted, and then he squinted hard. Episode 14, Sorry Andres. Monica lifted her face and looked directly at the man with her pair of moistened eyes. Stefan's chilling faint smile suddenly froze in place. His orbs constricted, and then he squinted hard. This face, which was trying to act strong, stunned his very being. His mind was momentarily blown away. She did not even look at his expression. Messily wiping off the tears from her eyes with the back of her hand, she indignantly said, Mister, I know it's my fault for not looking at where I'm going, but you don't have to act condescendingly to pity me. I don't need it. After saying these words, she was no longer bothered with him and treated him as if he were non-existent. She bent down to pick up the documents on the ground and turned to leave quickly, not looking at him even once. Stefan gazed at her swiftly departing back. He was somewhat in a daze, unable to retract his sight from her for a long time. The unwavering gaze and stance made his mind fly far out all of a sudden. Just by rewinding his memories, he could vividly recall the night he shared with the blindfolded young girl, the girl who was forced to withstand all of him. He still remembered how he had delved into her delicate body and suffocated in her tightness. He willfully took control of her, 
observing her pinned down body made him happy and her miserable. Sobbing face, he loved looking at it. She was such a delicate girl. She was just like a bubble that would pop with one touch. However, in front of him, she showed a brave face and cautiously protected her poor pride. These types of girls could really move men and make them care for them. Therefore, tough as a man might be, the little tenderness in him was evoked. Although he was proud and aloof, he was still no exception. Unlike other women, she had never gone through an intimate session before. She looked younger and tender. She was outrageously youthful. She was like an unripe fruit that still tasted extremely sour. However, that delicate girl just happened to incidentally trigger the desire suppressed deep within him for so long. He wanted her. His body kept raging so bad that the so-called formula was no longer as simple as that afterward. He wanted her to be his entirely, to be forcefully bound to him until the last moment of her life. As an afterthought, it was simply unusual. When was a woman able to seduce him, Stefan, to the point where he would lose control of his thoughts and she would be able to manipulate him? Nonetheless, it could not be denied that he, a man who had always been able to control himself, was unable to do so with her around. After that day, he forced himself not to visit the girl again, as he could intuitively tell that she was a dangerous existence to him. The noble blood of emperors and overlords flowed in his veins, and just like the wind, he was unfettered by anything. Only he could be tyrannical and domineering. Only he could remain unbound. He did not like to be out of control because of women or anything else. He even subconsciously suppressed himself because of these restrictions. However, his body was actually lingering on these sensations. The corners of his mouth curled up. He turned around and caught sight of an item on the ground. He slowly leaned forward and picked it up. She had actually left her identification card behind by accident. In a hurry, she failed to notice her identification card on the ground. Stefan could not help but grin. He took out his phone. Mark, help me check on someone. Yes, Director. The name is... The girl's bashful and warm smiling face was displayed on the identification card. Her pair of moist orbs was shimmering and lustrous. It was as if they contained a bucket full of sunlight. The radiance in her eyes seemed capable of stunning people of all eras. He dragged his words out. Monica Thames. At this time, the class was about to end at the kindergarten. She originally intended to fetch Andres to enjoy his favorite lobster trap truffle mac and cheese. Earlier today, she had asked Andres to wait for her at school after class dismissal. However, Monica did not want to pick up Andres looking this haggard, so she hurriedly took a cab home, changed into a fresh set of clothes, and tidied herself up. Thus, by the time she arrived at the kindergarten, all the children, except for Andres, who was carrying his bag and sitting by the school entrance alone, had already gone home. From afar, she immediately spotted the little guy with his head lowered, and his hand clenching onto something. He was looking at it with utmost concentration. Monica suppressed the sadness in her heart and tapped her cheeks. Putting on a smile, she walked toward him. Andres! Andres raised his head. Seeing that it was her, his face lit up and formed a dazzling smile. He quickly jumped off his seat and excitedly ran toward her. He opened his arms and gleefully jumped around while he acted coy in front of her. Mommy, huggies! Mommy, hug Andres. Monica slightly lowered her stance. The little guy then rushed into her arms, just like a cotton ball, and gave affection to her. His milky white face lovingly snuggled into her neck as he pouted his small lips. Feeling a little indignant, he said, Mommy, why did you come so late? Andres waited for so long. Sorry, Andres. Something happened at Mommy's workplace, so I was late. Okay, Andres forgives Mommy then. The little guy tilted his head upwards. His attractive eyes gently formed an arch. His bright orbs seemed to be filled with shards of sunlight. Andre slightly smiled and then pursed his lips pitifully. His hands tapped on his tummy and he whined. Mommy, Andres is hungry. Mommy promised to bring Andres to eat lobster trap truffle mac and cheese today. When are we going? Upon hearing his words, Monica's expression slightly changed. She was in a bit of a dilemma. All her savings in the bank were already used to pay off the debt of that disappointing Emma. When she got fired today, 
Her manager paid her this month's salary and a lump sum, but these could only be transferred to her account the next day. For now, she was really strapped for cash. Lobster trap truffle mac and cheese was Andre's favorite. However, it was too expensive. So only on special days or when she received a bonus would she be able to take him out to eat it. Monica felt a little bitter inside. She raised her eyes and looked at Andre's. Her hand gently caressed his soft cheek and in a half-pacifying manner said, Andres, let's eat at home today, all right? Just as she said this, Andres' smile froze up, with his eyes drooping in disappointment, lips slowly pouting and brows creasing. He mumbled, Mommy, you promised me. You can't go back on your words. He tightly clenched the piece of paper in his hand. He was feeling very sullen that his pale face turned red as he emotionally bit on his lower lip with his pearly white teeth. His thick curly lashes picked up a few drops of moisture, a sign that he was about to cry. Monica was at a loss on what to do when she saw the little guy tear up in disappointment. Flustered, she hastily wiped off his tears with her hands and sadly said, Andres, please don't cry. Mommy will do what mommy promised you. Andres gently turned away. He appeared to be rather peeved. Monica hesitated for quite a while before biting her lower lip. Ultimately, she decided to break the news of her losing her job to him. She did not want to leave the image of her lying to him in Andre's memory. Sorry, Andres. Today, mommy lost her job, so... Episode 15, Secret Revealed Sorry, Andres. Today, Mommy lost her job, so... Upon hearing this, Andres, astonished, looked at her with widened eyes. Why? Did Mommy do something wrong? Monica shook her head, stroking his hair. No, Mommy will go search for a job tomorrow. Mommy is so competent. I'll definitely find a job with a higher pay. From then on, Mommy will take you to eat lobster, trap, truffle, mac and cheese every day. Okay... Andre's eyes drooped as he nodded obediently. When Monica was not paying attention, Andres hid the parent's letter in his hand behind his back, not letting her see it. He then lifted his head and said, while smiling, Mommy, let's go home. Monica, who did not see his little movement, was unaware of what he had hidden away. This was the case until a few days later. After dinner, Andres obediently cleared up the utensils. Placing a small stool in the kitchen, his small hands washed the dishes with warm water in a clumsy yet focused manner. He was so considerate and knew to help Monica around the house that he did not seem to only be a six-year-old child. Monica rummaged through the shelves and found an outdated vintage phone. She inserted a phone card in it and turned it on. Seeing a few missed calls from Andre's former teacher, she then returned the call. The form teacher received her call and informed her about a spring trip to the safari, which was organized by the kindergarten. The parents' letter had been distributed a few days prior, but Andres had yet to hand in his submission. Thus, she called Monica to ask for her consent. Monica was a little shaken, as she truly did not have knowledge of this matter. Thus, behind her son's back, she secretly rummaged through his small bag. Only then did she see the form mentioned by the teacher. On the other end of the phone, the form teacher conversed in a somewhat cautious manner, seemingly afraid to say something inappropriate. Forgive me for being straightforward. Andres is really looking forward to the spring trip with the other children. Furthermore, the amount to pay is not a lot. Are you perhaps having any financial difficulties? Monica hurriedly denied. Of course not. I'll submit this form along with the fee tomorrow. Monica hung up the phone with a complex expression. Skimming through the form, she then signed her name on it with a pen. Make Wealth Financial Group, otherwise known as Lewis Group. Gracia entered the CEO's office, yet Stefan was not present. His accompanying assistant, Mark, who was in the midst of placing a thick pile of documents on Stefan's table, noticed Gracia's arrival and promptly lowered his head in greeting. Hello, madam. Um, she hummed in response. Sweeping her eyes around the office, she looked at him and asked, where is the CEO? He replied respectfully. Oh, the boss is not in the office at the moment. Where did he go? 
There is an investment project between Lewis Group and Winged Group in the afternoon. As to when he will be back, I currently do not know. If this is so, she trailed off as she caught sight of the thick pile of documents laid on the table. She went over and held some up. Lifting her head, she gestured to him and asked, What are these? Mark went stiff. He hesitated for a moment before giving his reply. Documents containing the information that the boss ordered me to gather yesterday. Information? I should be able to take a look, right? She probed. Mark did not answer and merely lowered his head to ponder. Gracia did not pay attention to him. She, the Lewis family's young mistress, was the future wife of the CEO. Why could she not go over her future husband's things? Therefore, without another word, she removed the seal and carefully took out the documents. Mark was Stefan's right-hand man. Therefore, he was expectedly reliable in whatever he did, and investigating a regular citizen was truly a simple task. He conducted a thorough investigation within a day and brought everything over to Stefan's office. However, he did not expect to run into Gracia. In front of her, he, a mere subordinate, naturally had no say in things, so he did not stop her from looking through the documents. The information collected was indeed very thorough. The thick stack of documents contained pictures and texts. Gracia flipped through them all, from the person's family background and the institute the subject had graduated from, down to the subject's marks. Everything was listed out explicitly. At first, she was puzzled. This was clearly just a normal girl, and she could not fathom why he would order an investigation into her identity. However, the more information she read, the more uncertain she felt. Monica? She had a vague impression of this name, but her memories were foggy until she reached one page and her expression immediately changed. It turned out to be that girl who had gone through surrogacy for her six years ago. It was no wonder she found the name a bit familiar. Six years ago, Stefan and she got engaged, but medical diagnoses revealed that she was infertile. This girl was personally chosen by Grandpa Lewis for surrogacy. Gracia was a little skeptical, even worried. She could not fathom why Stefan would want to investigate the girl. It stated in these documents that Monica also had a six-year-old son named Andres Thames. Andres Thames is six years old, the same age as Sam. Gracia slowly narrowed her eyes. She still remembered that the surrogate had conceived a pair of identical twins back then. However, due to premature delivery and the older twin almost absorbing all the nutrients in the mother's body, when the younger twin was born, he was already not breathing and he was pronounced dead. She suddenly had a bad feeling and proceeded to seriously go through a few more pages, flipping to Andre's information. When she reached the end of the report, her palms became clammy while her heart boiled with rage. In the portfolio, she saw another set of photographs. She hastily took all of them out and checked each piece. The few photographs she saw featured a good-looking boy, with the background being kindergarten. It seemed that all these photos were taken at a kindergarten. The boy's delicate features, handsome side profile, and similar appearance to little Sam confirmed all her suspicions at once. Her grip immediately tightened, distorting the photograph. Gracia bit her lower lip harshly. Could it be that the child did not die back then? Or that, for six years, that woman had hidden this child? Gracia was instantly flustered, and layers of ice covered her heart. What exactly was the intention of this woman called Monica? The child was clearly not stillborn, so why did she not say anything? Perhaps she wanted to use her custody rights of this child to properly claim compensation from the Lewises? Maybe her ambitions went beyond that. She might be intending to use the child as a bargaining chip to set foot into the Lewis group. After all, she was the biological mother of the two children. As for her, while she was the Lewis family's young mistress and future wife of Lewis Group's CEO, she was completely unrelated to the two children. Since ancient times, mothers have always been successful at elevating their status through their sons. This was even more so for wealthy families. Episode 16 the secret buried for many years. Since ancient times, mothers had always been successful at elevating their status through their sons. This was even more so for wealthy families. 
Gracia's complexion gradually turned pale, her fingertips trembling quite a bit. Mark, who was standing on the side, noted her pale face and asked cautiously, Ma'am, are you alright? I'm fine. She tried to be calm on the surface, but when she saw another photograph, her eyes opened in horror. In the photograph, the girl, who was standing in front of the entrance to a university in her graduation gown, had a warm smile on her face. Astounded, she gasped. Gracia clearly had a hard time believing this as she went over another photograph. There were not many photos of Monica, but the few Gracia saw were enough to make her tremble. The girl's face still had an inextinguishable impression in her heart. It was... it was... her? No way! There could not be so many coincidences. Gracia could no longer maintain a calm face. Panic-stricken, she placed the photograph aside and picked up Monica's documents with trembling hands once more. She was previously not concerned, so she just skimmed through the text. But now, she carefully read all the document written, not wanting to miss any. When her sight landed on the words, Orphanage Center, she was shocked to the core that she froze up, her heart and soul filling with horror. She... Her lips slowly moved apart, her eyes never leaving the documents. She was already unable to complete a sentence. Noticing her dazed expression, Mark glanced at the documents. He mistakenly thought that she did not understand the information written, so he explained them to her patiently. Monica, biological parents are unknown. No leads regarding her real family. When she was six, she was sent to an orphanage center. At the age of eight, she was adopted by the Thames family. She is 23 this year. She graduated from the University of Los Angeles. She was also your surrogate six years ago. Gracia looked at the information written in black and white. With her heart thumping fast, her mind flew back to that day she first saw her. Fifteen years ago. Children's Home Society of California. Back then, Gracia was just an ordinary orphan waiting for adoption. As she had a lovable face, the staff in the orphanage center adored her. They held her in esteem just like a princess. Many children wanted to play with her. However, the children at the orphanage center were different from those outsides. They might be getting along on the surface, but they were secretly at loggerheads with one another. Every day, someone would visit the orphanage to adopt a child, who was better looking or more well-mannered would have a higher chance of getting adopted. Even then, the young Gracia had lofty ambitions and did not easily admit defeat. Her mother was just a lowly massage therapist at a bar. When she gave birth to her, she unhesitatingly discarded her at the entrance to a hospital. She was picked up by a poor couple, and she lived a life of poverty for a few years. When a car accident took her adoptive parents' lives, she became an orphan again and was sent over to the orphanage center. From that day on, she told herself that she wanted to live a good life and get adopted by a wealthy person. One day, a seven-year-old girl was brought in. Rumors had it that her mother had died, so she was brought to the orphanage. The girl, despite her unkempt appearance, was absolutely ethereal and beautiful. Gracia saw a piece of jade on her. It seemed to be quite valuable, so she took it for her own when the girl was asleep. When the girl woke up and realized that her jade was gone, she wailed miserably. However, at that time, Gracia was held in high regard by the adults and her peers. No one believed that she had stolen the girl's jade. No one believed the girl's words. Afterward, a wealthy-looking elderly man came to the welfare center and summoned her over. The elderly man took out a keepsake similar to the jade she was holding. When the two were put together, they actually fit perfectly. She was unaware of the jade's importance and simply lied that it was something her mother had left for her. The elderly man believed her words and brought her back to the Lewis residence, naming her Gracia and quickly setting her as Stefan's fiancé when he was 14. Back to the present in the CEO's office, Gracia weakly dropped down on the sofa. She supported her forehead with a palm as cold sweat drenched her back. She tightly gripped the documents in her hand, her fingertips shuddering out of her control. She was very flustered. She could not guess why Stefan had someone investigate all this. Could he have noticed something unusual about her origin? And he started to cast doubt on her real identity, despite her being brought back by Grandpa Lewis personally back then. Her heart jumped once as she considered this possibility. In actuality, she did steal that piece of jade from Monica. Growing up in the orphanage center, because she looked sweet and well-behaved, she was deeply loved 
and highly regarded by everyone. She was still young back then. She had never seen anything good. Therefore, when she saw the girl's beautiful piece of jade, she was overwhelmed with greed and took it on impulse. After that, Elena discovered that her jade had been stolen. She went to confront Gracia after noticing it on her. Unfortunately for Elena, not a single soul within the orphanage center was against Gracia. With this framing, Elena instead took a beating from the director, and her hands were hit by the teacher's ruler as punishment. She cried for several nights because it was so painful. However, Gracia had never imagined that the piece of jade was actually entangled to such a twisted family background. Fifteen years ago, under the layers of misunderstanding, she was brought back to the Lewis residence by Peter Lewis, the Lewis Group's chairman, also the head of the Lewis family, and her name was then changed. As for the Jade's origin, Grandpa Lewis never divulged anything about it. The only piece of information he cared to share with her was that it was her mother's relic. Upon their arrival at the Lewis residence, Grandpa Lewis took the piece of Jade from her and kept it along with the other half. From time to time, she would see him lost in thought while staring at the jade, as if he were reminiscing about someone. Peter Lewis only told her about that woman when she was a little older. This is when she realized the woman was someone he had adopted when he was in his middle age. Still, he only said this much about her, as if he were purposefully keeping something from her, and said nothing else. She then became the Lewis family's young mistress and grew up surrounded by this love. Eventually, she was betrothed to his grandson, Stefan Lewis. From start till end, she did not tell the truth about how she came to be in possession of the jade, concealing it intentionally. She knew that if she were to come clean about it, then everything that she had right now, wealth and family, would be gone in a flash. She would lose her position as the Lewis family's young mistress, and she would lose Stefan. She was not reconciled to this. She was unwilling to let go, and she did not plan to return all these to its real owner as well. She admitted that this was selfish of her. It was too unfair for that girl. However, she did not regret doing this. Lavishing in all of this, she somewhat lost herself in her greed. At first, when she became part of the Lewis family, she was still slightly guilty and uneasy. After all, these things truly did not belong to her, but to that girl called Elena. Episode 17, Lives Exchanged At first, when she became part of the Lewis family, she was still slightly guilty and uneasy. After all, these things truly did not belong to her, but to that girl called Elena. Happiness came to her so suddenly that everything seemed nothing more than an illusion. It was as if the moment she opened her eyes, everything would turn out to be just a dream. However, when she did open her eyes again... She was still lying in the soft, big bed within the princess-like bedroom. Peter Lewis sat by her side. His stern face could hardly mask the love he had for her. He was so very gentle to her, spoiling her rotten and doting on her with his heart and soul. What she wanted, he would satisfy. Gracia had never experienced parental love before and had never known such a luxurious life. So she had immersed herself in this sudden delight once more. However... The real reason she selfishly wanted all of this was the man. The Lewis family was wealthy and influential in the capital, and Stefan was a man many rich young ladies desired. He was so outstanding that it went beyond people's imagination. Why was God only fond of him, blessing him with so much to the point of excessiveness? He had a family that was so financially strong that it could rival a country, a godly appearance, a noble and lofty status and otherworldly talent and skills. Any one of these would make others green with envy. Yet, he had everything. She became greedy and obsessed. It was to the extent that she lost herself. Although the title of the Lewis family's young mistress and future CEO's wife was stolen from another person, God had actually never treated her unfairly. A slight error in thought and one's life could unexpectedly change tremendously. She became the future wife of this huge business empire's CEO. She was uneasy and fearful at first, but she eventually settled down and enjoyed everything that did not belong to her. However, fate seemed to love playing with people. She ironically did not have the ability to get pregnant. This was congenital. 
Although Peter Lewis had contacted many people in the medical field, none could cure her infertility. What was more ironic was that the surrogate that Peter Lewis had employed turned out to be the true owner of that piece of jade. Gracia was drenched in a cold sweat as she was filled with a sense of crisis. After many years, they finally met again. Nine years ago, she snatched away Elena's jade and took possession of everything belonging to her. Nine years later, Elena became her surrogate and gave birth to his children. Somehow, an invisible bond seemed to tie the girl with Stefan, which made Gracia uneasy. Stefan, ordering this investigation on Monica, did it mean that he was starting to doubt Gracia's identity and the legitimacy of her ownership claim over that piece of jade? Impossible! She had been meticulous in concealing everything for all these years. In fact, she was nearing adulthood. Peter Lewis once suspected her. He was in too much of a rush back then, so when he saw her in possession of the jade, he did not conduct any identity verification. However, as she grew up, although she became more beautiful and refined, she did not look anything like that woman, and he grew suspicious. Thus, Grandpa Lewis secretly took some of her hair and sent it for DNA testing. She was smart, though, sensing that something was wrong and learning of his intention. She secretly bribed every person in the Department of Genetics to falsify the results of the DNA test. As a corollary, Peter Lewis was thoroughly convinced of her legitimacy. These past few years, she thought that she had not given herself away even once. Moreover, with the DNA results as a piece of evidence, she had nothing that would cause suspicion. Gracia quickly cast her doubt away, but the weight did not lift off her shoulders. Is it because of that child? Perhaps Stefan had known all along that the child was alive and had only been hidden away by that woman. So when he suspected her of having malicious intentions toward the Lewis family, he had someone investigate her identity? It was surely because of that. Gracia suddenly raised her head. She looked at Mark while feigning her calmness and coldly ordered, Don't tell anyone that I saw these documents. Get it? Just treat it as if you didn't see anything. Mark slightly stiffened. He obviously did not know of the reason behind her warning. He only knew that she had removed the information about Monica's life at the orphanage center ten years ago and about Andres from the pile. Not lifting her head, she said in a neutral voice, Don't mention anything about this child, including this woman's past to the CEO. Also, don't mention this woman's life at the orphanage center. Understood? He blankly raised a brow. When he did not give her an answer, Gracia's voice became frostier. Did you hear what I have just said? Mark lowered his head and remained mum. His superior was still Stefan. Although Gracia was admittedly the future wife of the Lewis Group CEO, she was just the manager of the Human Resources Department. He need not listen to her orders. The things that the CEO had ordered him to investigate, he naturally had the responsibility to deliver it fully. Gracia seemed to have seen through his thoughts. However, letting out a mirthless laugh, she coldly asked, What? Do you think that since you are the CEO's direct subordinate, you don't need to listen to me? You think that because I'm just the Human Resources Department's manager, I can't supervise you? With a sneer, she stood up. She then approached the man and looked him up and down. Faced with her scrutiny that was like needle pricks, Mark lowered his head to think as he listened to her speak. Despite me not having a lot of power in the Lewis group, I believe I still have the ability to drive you into a corner. Shocked, he raised his head to look at her. Keep your lips properly sealed about this matter. Understand? She ordered once more. He remained silent for a long time. Eventually, he sucked in a breath of cold air and nodded his head with some difficulty. I understand. By the time Stefan returned, Gracia had already left with her guilt. She must do everything to prevent any information of that woman from reaching Stefan, lest he should figure out the truth. Stefan was her man. She would not give him to any other woman. Mark might be Stefan's loyal subordinate, but he knew of Gracia's position in the Lewis family. With Grandpa Lewis supporting her, he dared not offend her lightly. Thus, when Stefan returned to his office and saw the few documents on the table, he laid his doubtful gaze on Mark. Under his piercing stare, Mark calmly said, Sir, Monica is indeed that surrogate six years ago. Hmm. His eyes glinted coldly. Suddenly he asked, Did you find anything suspicious about her? My reply to you, sir, is none. Recalling Gracia's warning, he lowered his head and pondered on with an indifferent expression. 
You may leave. Stefan did not probe any further. He was held up with something more important, so he temporarily set this matter aside. Episode 18, Welcoming a Friend on Her Losing her identification card was simply adding fuel to the fire to Monica, who was already facing living constraints and desperately looking for a job. The day after she lost her identification card, she went to apply for a replacement, but the local police were truly and overly lazy. They dragged and delayed again and again, as if they were not taking her seriously, by giving her all sorts of perfunctory excuses. Two weeks had gone by, yet a temporary identity document was still not issued. She almost burst into rage at the police station. She went to several job interviews, but all the companies rejected her application because she did not have any identity documents. She did not inform Matthew about her getting fired from her job, but he somehow caught wind of it. And despite not knowing the reason why, he gave her money for living expenses. When her friend, Sophia Gilbert, who had just returned from overseas, also learned of this, she generously lent her a hefty amount to tide over until she found a new job. Sophia was a close friend and confidant that she met in high school. They were really close to each other and were more like real sisters. When Heer says of Monica's pregnancy spread around the campus back then, everyone suspected her of being provided by a boss. Only Sophia stood up for her without a second thought. Originally, they promised to study abroad together, but Monica ended up not going because of problems in her adoptive family. Sophia absolutely hated her for breaking that promise and even pointedly ignored her at one point in time. Eventually, their misunderstanding was resolved. Now that Sophia was back in the country, Monica brought Andres along to welcome her. The moment they saw each other, Sophia, with glistening eyes, tightly held Monica in her arms at once. Three years apart, the longing and affection, tears uncontrollably welled up in Monica's eyes as all sorts of overwhelming emotions surged forth within her. Sophia was about to properly complain of her failing to keep up with their appointment when, in her peripheral view, she spotted Andre standing by her side. In a split second, Sophia's eyes widened to the size of a bronze bell. She stared unblinkingly and blankly at such a cute boy for a long time. Although she had seen much of the world, she was still instantly attracted by Andre's handsome and youthful features. This was especially the case when his radiant orbs, which were as clear as water, stared at her as he gave her a gentle smile. His looks were truly enough to melt her heart. Oh, oh my god, this little guy is way too cute! Sophia bent down halfway and cupped Andre's fair and clear face. She badly wanted to rub him into her embrace and give him smooches. She asked, <laughs> Monica, is he your younger brother? Monica grinned and thereafter explained. No, let me introduce you to him. This is my son, Andres Thames. Pausing for a moment, she then said to her son, Andres, this is Auntie Sophia, the one mommy told you about before. Stupefied, Sophia's expression instantly froze. What? What did you just say? With an elegant and gentle smile, Andres answered on behalf of Monica. Aunt Sophia, hello, this is my mommy. I'm Andre's Thames, and you can call me Andy. Son? Mommy? What on earth is going on here? Sophia was momentarily dumbfounded. She examined them back and forth. This little guy's soft, pinkish lips and faint dimples were exactly the same as Monica's. She thought that Monica getting pregnant was just a rumor. Never did she think that it was actually true. All of a sudden, she felt overwhelmed by all this information about her best friend. Huh? That's not right. No matter where one looked, this child was already six or seven years of age. Calculating the time when he was born, it was probably one year before she went to study abroad. Monica could not help but laugh. <laughs> it's a long story. Let's eat first. Sophia nodded. She brought the mother-son pair to a Western restaurant that she used to patronize and booked a private room. After ordering, Sophia hurriedly pulled her into the washroom to probe. Monica did not want to hide anything from her, so she just laid everything bare to her without going into much detail. Sophia listened until her heart ached terribly. To actually treat you like that, 
Your stepmom is simply too cruel and unscrupulous. Six years ago, when my father told me about the Thames family's ability to pay off all their massive debts in a year, I thought it was strange. I never expected you to make such a significant sacrifice. What's the point of all that? Monica laughed unaffectedly and self-deprecatingly. Uh, I'm just expressing my appreciation. Furthermore, all of this is in the past. Because I did this for the Thames, it counted as my way of repaying my father for raising me. Monica carried a dark cloud in her heart from her orphanage center experience, where she was subjected to various forms of bullying. If it hadn't been for Matthew's adoption, she would have been unable to bear all those humiliations. Even up to now, Matthew's fatherly love for her did not diminish. To top it all off, even though the time after she gave birth to Andres was difficult and somewhat unbearable, like an abyss of misery, she had no regrets about it now. It was truly a blessing from the heavens to have such a heartwarming son as Andres. She was really overjoyed. It had been a long six years. Even a poignant memory would also fade away. Then, Sophia was afraid of how sensitive she was, so she brought up the next matter with caution. You're not afraid that Andres' biological father would take him away? Monica's eyes became disoriented for a split second. Remembering that man, she answered, that's why I need to keep Andre's survival a secret. If no one brings it up, no one can take Andre's away. She did not know who Andre's father was, and she was not interested in knowing. It had nothing to do with her. Andre's was her dearest baby. She absolutely would not allow anyone to snatch him away. Even if it was his biological father, she would not allow it. Sensing that she did not want to talk about it, Sophia did not continue pursuing the matter. Her face, thereafter, displayed admiration. That's so good. You have such an attractive son. Returning into the room, she could not help but throw herself at Andres. She pinched his little cheeks and said, Andres, you look so cute when you smile. She then formed an expression standard for cajoling a child. Andres, go with Aunt, okay? Aunt will take care of you, bring you to eat stuff, and let you play with exciting things. Andres placed down the cup of tea in his hand, elegantly wiped his fingers with a table napkin. He then revealed a disarming smile. Aunt Sophia, mommy told me that I cannot go with a stranger. I'll get abducted. Sophia froze up. In the midst of their chatter, Sophia suddenly asked, Monica, since you look so pretty, have you ever thought of entering Foxcom Entertainment to develop your career? Foxcom Entertainment? Monica's brows twitched. She was somewhat astonished by her statement, yet Sophia only fixed her with a disdainful stare. Foxcom Entertainment is preparing to shoot a new movie, and a nationwide audition is currently being held to cast the female lead. You should go give it a try. After all, acting used to be your dream. Monica slowly formed a smile. Back then, she was a university student majoring in media arts and was looking to venture into the entertainment industry. It was only a step forward. However, because her family was in dire straits, she gave up this dream. Don't tell me you don't know about that company. Foxcom Entertainment is backed by Makewell Financial Group, the business empire within the top 100 worldwide. Episode 19, Audition for the Female Lead Don't tell me you don't know of that company. Foxcom Entertainment is backed by Makewell Financial Group, the business empire within the top 100 worldwide. After she spoke of Make Wealth Financial Group, Sophia's eyes lit up with eagerness. Make Wealth Financial Group can be said to be a hegemon in the financial industry. You just think about it. In the face of the global economic crisis, large corporations folded, but Make Wealth Financial Group still stood tall, seemingly unaffected by it all. The CEO of that conglomerate is a powerful figure. He has a strong family background, has wealth that can rival a country, and is likely sought after by many female socialites. With a strong and stable backer like Make Wealth, Foxcom Entertainment has a leading position in the entertainment industry. When she started to talk about Make Wealth CEO that occasionally appeared on TV, Sophia instantly transformed into a chatterbox. In front of Monica, she was itching to gossip about the man's entire family tree. However, Monica held no interest in this topic at all. She interrupted her good friend. Why are you louding it into the skies? Aren't you exaggerating? You've seen too little of this world, haven't you? Everyone in the capital knows of Makewell Financial Group's prominent position. 
It's acceptable for you not to know who the mayor is here, but how can you not know of make wealth? Sophia continued mysteriously. I heard it through the grapevine that even if one is an important government official in the country, that person still has to give a face to that corporate group. Sophia briefly paused and, with a face full of admiration, she added, Honestly speaking, the value of Make Wealth CEO is immeasurable, even today. Not one can exactly measure how many hundreds of billions or trillions are to his name. This powerful figure is extremely secretive in the media. How he does things is way too mysterious. You're taking it too far, aren't you? Monica calmly took a sip of her coffee. Sophia looked exasperated. Monica, you didn't really give up your dream back then, did you? Acting has indeed been my dream. Monica looked somewhat doubtful. But in the past, a production crew visited her school to conduct an audition for a drama's female lead. Her tutor recommended her for the character. It was such a golden opportunity, but she did not seize it. At that time, the show gained immense popularity across the country, and all the actors that were cast became famous. Sophia said, Foxcom Entertainment always holds the talented in high regard. As long as you have the talent, you will be valued by them. <sighs> as for me, I wanted to audition because of that renowned CEO, but my physical appearance is regrettably not good enough. I can be a small model, but once I'm thrown inside a company full of talents, I can barely reach a passable level. Therefore, Monica, why don't you give acting a shot instead of applying to some small-scale companies? You have a strong gift for acting, and you're very talented. Don't squander it. I believe if it is you, you can make it. After Sophia gave her encouragement, filled with confidence, Monica was in a daze for a long time. Foxcom Entertainment Make Wealth Financial Group? For some unknown reason, once these words were spoken, her eyelids kept twitching badly. The nationwide audition for the female lead of the movie The Forbidden Love under the youth angst genre, which was invested by Foxcom Global Productions, was underway. It was said that this movie's lineup was quite remarkable. The original novel ranked first under the teen fiction category for three consecutive years. The person directing this movie was James Scott, a director who had clinched the best director title at several award functions. Meanwhile, the movie's male lead was already confirmed to be played by the superstar Martin Lee. The superstar's large fan base alone was enough to make up for half of the movie's sales. If one could seize the female lead role, she could definitely rise to stardom. James Scott once received the title of Best Director in the Global Film Festival, so as long as he supported the female star, that person was guaranteed a bright future. Many artists had been racking their brains for ways to enter his production. At nighttime, Emma also brought up this matter to her family. During dinner, she suddenly put down her utensils and seriously looked at Matthew James. Dad, I want to discuss something with you. I hope you can approve of it. Matthew glanced at his daughter coldly and asked, What is it? I want to participate in the audition held by Foxcom Entertainment. He was confused. What audition? Oh my, Dad, don't you know? Foxconn Global Productions has invested in a film adaptation of a famous novel. The male lead is already set to be Martin Lee. Now the director is conducting a nationwide search for the female lead. Emma briefly paused and proudly lifted her chin, her eyes sparkling with confidence. Dad, don't you think I'm very suitable for the female lead role? I have the confidence to succeed in this audition. This is a once-in-a-lifetime chance. If I'm successful in this audition, then I can be a star. And when I become famous, you and mom can live a good life. The moment I get my first paycheck, I'll bring you two on a trip, buy a good house, and purchase a good car. As Emma spoke, she disdainfully looked at Monica from the corner of her eye. Monica only continued to eat with her head down, though it was unknown she was currently thinking. Matthew could not help but furrow his brows when he heard this. Instead of thinking about this nonsense all day long... Why can't you find a stable job? Oh, Dad, I have the making of a star. Why would you want me to waste it by having a boring day job? Emma expressed her disapproval. He shook his head and profoundly said, When I was young, I suffered because of my foolishness. You're still young. Bring your mind back from that daydream, enroll in a good university, and find a stable job. Stop filling your head with these silly ideas. Dad, why are you so stubborn? 
What do you mean by silly ideas? It is profitable being a star. Just by shooting a production, you can earn hundreds of thousands of dollars. Nowadays, it's no longer important to hold a degree to live a good life. Emma rebuked, clearly annoyed by her father's old-fashioned thinking. Matthew busied himself with eating his food and did not speak again. Emma then coaxed. Dad, don't you think the condition of our house is very poor? A broken house, a broken fridge, a broken TV? Haven't you thought of living in a bigger house? Seeing Matthew remain silent, she fantasized longingly again. Oh, if I become a star, I can earn so much money from just one production. Afterward, I will have the money to afford a spacious and luxurious villa for you and mom to live in comfort. Her statement made Rosie grin from ear to ear. She thought that her daughter was so sweet, as if her heart was filled with honey and spoke with joy. My daughter is so well behaved. Mommy is happy to hear you say that. Soon after, she spoke to Matthew. Matthew, our daughter is so thoughtful, hmm? Huh? She's totally unlike a certain someone who is not thoughtful at all. She was, of course, referring to Monica, but the latter acted as if she had not heard anything. Matthew then wrinkled his brows again. Becoming a star. <laughs> I'll be lucky if you don't bring me trouble. I heard that that industry is chaotic. Emma urged once more. <laughs> Dad, even this day and age is chaotic. Bad people are lurking at every corner and everywhere is a mess. If I were slightly stronger, do you think I would still be afraid to walk on the crooked path? Episode 20, Applying for the Position of an Artist Assistant Emma urged again, Dad, even this day and age is chaotic. Bad people are lurking at every corner, and everywhere is a mess. If I were slightly stronger, do you think I would still be afraid to walk on the crooked path? Rosie chimed in, Matthew, what our daughter said makes sense. It's good that she's being filial and is trying to earn money to take care of us. Our daughter has the thought, so shouldn't we support her? Rosie, who was yearning for grandeur, invested all her energy on Emma. She was eagerly waiting for her daughter to catapult to the top, climbing up the social ladder, and find a wealthy partner. Although Emma was not exactly similar to Rosie, as mother and daughter, they were cast in the same mold, so she was also superficial and vain. She was only willing to go through the good times and not the bad times. She usually followed the headlines of the entertainment news ogling at the dazzling female movie superstars walking down the red carpet at the Global Film Festival, they took her breath away. She would often read and saw news of female celebrities marrying into wealthy families, subsequently elevating their social statuses in life. She was filled with envy. Deep down, she was thinking that as long as she could step foot in this prestigious industry, she would have wealth and status. Matthew sighed time after time. Oh, fine. If you like it, then go ahead. You're not a child anymore. Since you have your plans, then go ahead and try them out. Just don't say I didn't warn you. That industry is a tiger's den to a child like you who has no social experience. I'm old and I don't have the ability to protect you whatsoever. Therefore, don't blame me for not helping you. It was late at night. When Andres climbed into bed, Monica sat in front of her computer and searched for job vacancies online. She initially wanted to declare her university major as finance, Yet, she accidentally majored in arts instead. She, however, was quite talented in the field of arts and had an advantageous physical appearance. Even if she were to be compared with the top-rated female celebrities, she would not necessarily be inferior to them. Coincidentally, she clicked into the official website of Foxcom Entertainment. Sliding into her site was a gorgeous-looking website. Notice about the nationwide audition for the female lead of the movie The Green Apple occupied the headlines. Many had invested in this movie, so if one snagged the female lead role, her rise to fame was guaranteed. Her road to stardom would be magnanimous in the entertainment industry. A magnanimous road to stardom meant that one could have a high income. It was not that Monica was unmoved, but when she looked at the notice board and actually saw that the company was hiring for an artist assistant, she made up her mind on what to do. A few days passed and she received her identification card. She sent Andres to the kindergarten in the morning. Hiding her completed resume inside her clothes, she took a cab to Foxcom Entertainment. At dawn, the morning rays of the sun shimmered and a light grassy fragrance lingered in the air. As she reached Foxcom Entertainment, she saw a long queue at the entrance. 
Monica was somewhat stumped at the scene. She had never seen such an extraordinary sight before. She was shocked, but did not let it show. Was there such a tight competition for the position of an artist assistant? After asking around, she then understood that the interview coincided with the first round of auditions for the female lead of The Forbidden Love. It was a large-scale event. Besides, those girls who were there to audition in pursuit of fame, many hardcore fans of Martin Lee, were also present. It was already confirmed to play the male lead. As for the female lead, the director decided to cast a fresh face. Thus, the production team started conducting nationwide auditions. The movie's promotional short was shot, and it created a huge sensation. Even if one excluded the abundant resources set for the movie, with Martin Lee's popularity alone, quite a number of students applied for the female lead role. Although the audition was held on a weekend, upon learning that the superstar Martin Lee would personally make an appearance at the venue, all his diehard fans came. There were even quite a few devoted ones who came from faraway places. The production crew did not expect his popularity to be over the top. Even with the presence of security to maintain order, it was still not enough to hold back his aggressive fandom. As big a building as the Foxcom Tower, it was instantly filled with a huge crowd. Fan support slogans hung on the walls and tree branches outside the building. It was as if the entire Foxcom entertainment was trampled over Martin Lee's fandom army. At the posh entrance of Foxcom Entertainment, several luxury cars were parked. Among these was a nanny van. In it were three men in casual attire gazing at the bustling crowd, which was mainly made up of female university students by the building entrance. They were all here for the audition. Each of them wore glamorous outfits to draw the director's attention to them as much as possible. Director James, I say these female students look good. Look at that one wearing a white dress. She has quite the feeling. She has a little innocence of Diana Stark in the original work, right? Oh, oh, look over there. The female in the black gown. She actually did her homework. She must have read the original work. In the novel, Diana Stark is wearing such a gown in her first appearance on the school stage. The young lady has good looks, but she isn't tall enough. The assistant stuck himself onto the car window and looked in the direction of the building entrance. He babbled and gesticulated just like the person in charge of selecting the emperor's harem in historical times. Turning to face the man in the white shirt, he noticed that his head was lowered as he flipped through the application forms and skimmed through the two-inch colored photos. Nonetheless, he appeared uninterested in all of this. Boring, James Scott emotionally remarked. He threw the list of names aside and did not bother to look at it again. Director James, what's wrong? James Scott dipped his head, smoked a cigarette, and replied monotonously, There's no one I want. Huh? His assistant was shocked and silly. James Scott was second to none when it came to producing youth movies. The films he had directed were always moneymakers. One of his past notable works, Heard That Love Returned, was a classic film. It also competed with Hollywood blockbusters. His passion and dedication to his work were why he had many classics under his belt. Nowadays, in the entertainment industry, movies were no longer a form of art. Due to business considerations, many directors had slowly shifted from the main theme of a movie. James was different. Others in the film industry knew how careful he was when choosing his casts, and how particular he was when it came to selecting a movie to produce. Previously, he had spent a hefty amount to acquire the rights to make a film adaptation of a famous novel. With regard to the novel's storyline, he was absolutely mesmerized. The Forbidden Love depicted a deep-rooted love story. The female lead, Diana Stark, and the male lead, Nathan Stark, were blood-related siblings. The two grew up together and eventually developed feelings for each other, which was forbidden between brothers and sisters. A road of love and hate intertwined the feelings that they had for each other were agonizing. Nathan Stark was to be played by Martin Lee. James chose the man not only because of his mounting popularity, but also because of his somber aura, which was absolutely similar to Nathan Stark's. Thank you for listening. Please don't forget subscribe. See you on the next episodes.